Good afternoon, everyone uh, who's joining us in, uh, in the Eastern time zone. And for those who are joining us from the West Coast, good morning. Uh, what a great way to kick off uh, Monday uh, and the beginning of May, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the GAO. Uh, my name is Garrett Johnson. I am the executive director of Lincoln Network. And we are focused as a team on connecting the technology and policy communities, leveraging technology to address public policy challenges and to improve governance. One of our policy team's focus area is modernizing Congress, improving Congress's science and technology capacity, and strengthening congressional oversight to improve government accountability and performance. 100 years ago, Congress created the Government Accountability Office, which at that time was known as the General Accounting Office. Uh, the purpose was to serve as the legislative branch's watchdog, providing nonpartisan information about government operations. GAO has provided a valuable service for the nation by improving the government's performance, uh, increasing transparency about government operations, and saving taxpayers dollars. But as we mark GAO's centennial, it's worth considering just how much the world and GAO's mission has changed since 1921. At that time, Congress was concerned about the federal government's growing debts following World War I. Uh, the commonly available technologies at that time included typewriters, slide rule calculators, and paper receipts. But today, information technology has fundamentally changed American life and government. And the federal government's operations have vastly expanded and our national debt will soon be larger than our nation's gross domestic product. The challenge for GAO and Congress overseeing government operations has likewise, likewise grown exponentially. And in its next century, GAO will have the opportunity to use new technology such as machine learning and data science to more aggressively oversee federal operations. Lincoln Network is honored to partner with Kevin Kosar of the American Enterprise Institute to convene today's discussion about the institutional development of GAO over the past century and to consider the role the government watchdog will play in the next 100 years. I spent about three years in the Senate uh, on the Foreign Relations Committee uh, and GAO was an invaluable tool uh, and an, an invaluable partner for me and my colleagues uh, while I worked there. So I have benefited firsthand from the important work that GAO does. Uh, to kick off today, we are honored to have uh, the Comptroller General uh, of GAO, Jean Dodaro, excuse me, uh, who will offer a short recorded remarks uh, via video. Uh, and then following that, we will turn uh, the session over to Kevin Kosar. Uh, so we'll watch the video now. Good day, everyone. I'm Jean Dodaro, Comptroller General of the United States and head of the GAO. It's a great pleasure to discuss GAO's history and its outlook with all of you. I want to thank the American Enterprise Institute and the Lincoln Network for putting on this event, focusing on GAO's role in government for the last 100 years and into the future. GAO exists to support the Congress in carrying out its constitutional responsibilities and to enhance the performance and accountability of government for the benefit of the American people. Our responsibilities are across the full breadth and scope of the federal government's activities. We provide constructive recommendations to improve government and save federal funds on behalf of American taxpayers. Over the last 100 years, a hallmark of GAO is that it has evolved and adapted as the government has changed. As I'm sure the first panel will discuss, GAO started out doing voucher audits after World War I. After that, there were more in-depth financial audits. When I started at GAO in the early 1970s, the agency was in the midst of its evolution from financial management issues 
as the primary activity to a focus on performance auditing, which is what we're known for today, evaluating programs, making sure they're efficient and effective, and importantly, accomplishing their objectives. After that transformation, we started looking at the need for government-wide management reforms. This included the establishment of chief financial officers and chief information officers across government, along with enhanced strategic planning and the development of performance measures to strengthen transparency and accountability. In recent years, we've continued to broaden the type of work we do. Accordingly, we've been adding additional disciplines to our workforce actuaries, scientists, computer security specialists, and a wide range of science and engineering disciplines. A top priority for me and the agency is to continue working on expanding our efforts on technology and science matters. We're doing more technology assessments, providing more technical services, plus evaluating science and technology programs and initiatives to assist in the oversight of federal investments in research, development, and advanced manufacturing. We're also compiling and utilizing best practices in engineering sciences to include estimating costs, designing integrated schedules, undertaking technology readiness assessments, and employing agile development processes. We've also established an audit innovation lab to explore, pilot, and deploy new advanced analytic capabilities, conduct research and information assurance, and explore emerging technologies that will impact future GAO practices. We're also striving to provide oversight, insight, and foresight. That foresight role continues to be an important one today. For example, in the cybersecurity area, that's something I've been long concerned about since the time I was in charge of our information technology work in the 1990s. We designated computer security as a high-risk area across the entire federal government in 1997. So no one could say that GAO didn't warn people about the implications of this area for federal government systems as well as critical infrastructure protection and more recently in protecting the privacy of individuals. Now we're doing more foresight work to alert the Congress to emerging issues such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and blockchain and digital ledger technologies. Our goal is to focus attention of policymakers and managers so they have time to think, deliberate, and act on policy recommendations before problems become a crisis. I will turn it over now to the panelists but I want to thank you again, both the, to the organizers as well as each of you here to virtually listen and ask questions. Have a good day. Well, hello, I'm Kevin Kosar, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And thank you for joining us on this Monday in May. This first panel discusses GAO's origins and duties, which are numerous, expansive, and have evolved a great deal over the past century. Now, before I go further, let me lay out a roadmap for this panel so you know where we're going. I'll speak briefly first, and then I'll introduce our terrific panel of experts, each of whom will have about 10 minutes to discuss an aspect of GAO's work. After that, we're gonna open it up to audience questions and conclude the panel by 2.30. That said, you do not have to wait to the Q&A section to queue up your question. Via Twitter and YouTube, you may directly submit your question whenever it occurs to you. There's no need to wait until two o'clock or whenever we get to that portion of the program. Now, let me exercise my moderator's privilege to explain why I was eager to put this, to, this event together with, uh, with Zach Graves and, and Lincoln Network. Um, Put succinctly, I wanted to use uh, this 100 year anniversary of GAO as an opportunity to recognize how valuable GAO's work is. Things get very busy in DC. There's so much going on all the time. And I hope that this event would allow many of us to just pause, take a breath and think about the importance of this institution. And for me, uh, I, I wanna speak to 
GAO and it's important on two levels, both the personal level and the institutional level. Now, speaking personally, I've relied on GAO's work throughout my career, uh, whether it was way back when I was doing my dissertation in the late 90s, uh, or last week when I was finishing up a white paper on an obscure aspect of appropriations. I've needed GAO's work to do my work. Uh, one instance, which I will never forget, um, involving GAO work, occurred early in my career at the Congressional Research Service. I was a new guy, and I had been asked to take responsibility for CRS's work on executive branch communications with the public. It's a relatively obscure topic. It's not something that I was necessarily prepared to do, uh, but I was assured that it was something that wasn't going to be too busy. We didn't get a whole lot of congressional requests about it. Now, as fate would have it, you know, a short time after I accepted this assignment, uh, the newspapers erupted with stories accusing the administration of that time of engaging in propaganda. And I didn't even know where to start with that uh, or what it possibly meant. Thankfully, GAO's massive corpus of work on this obscure topic was there for me. And I was able to get schooled up in it. And I was actually able to help Congress understand it themselves because many of them were quite confused about this. They had never tackled this topic before and it was a big deal. Now, getting beyond me and my, my personal uh, uh, reliance upon GAO and its work, uh, there's the broader institutional value worth mentioning. GAO is one of the legislative branch support agencies. And these agencies play a critical and seldom appreciated role in representative democracy. In short, GAO and the legislative branch support agencies help educate members of Congress on policy. Nobody, no matter how smart, be it a representative, a senator, or a staffer, comes to DC as a full-blown expert on all government policies. How could they? The federal government has something like 180 agencies and thousands upon thousands of policies that are frequently super complex and have long histories. And sometimes there's the law, there's the regulation, and then there's the actual agency practice in executing, and they may not be quite the same. In order to help Congress fulfill its constitutional governance duties, Congress needs help. And that's what GA do, GAO does through its educational materials and its direct outreach. GAO reports, I would also add, um, help focus the dialogue on Capitol Hill, which is often anchored on political topics and reelection and other such things. Those are important, but the GAO reports and GAO activities help get Congress to focus a bit more on policy and oversight. GAO reports as such both direct and inform the discussion, which is welcome because there's politics and there's governance. And while the two are related, they're not synonymous. So thank you to GAO for all you do. Now, let's get to the reason the audience is here to hear from this august panel of experts. Let me briefly introduce each speaker. With us today, we have Kate Sigurud, Chief Operating Officer at GAO. Dr. Tim Bowling, Chief Quality Officer at GAO. Eda Emanuele Perez, Deputy General Counsel at GAO. And Elise Bean, the Washington Office Director of the Levin Center at Wayne Law. I'll tell you a little more about each, each of these speakers in turn right before they give their presentations. So without further delay, let me move to our first panelist. Who is Kate Cigarette? She is GAO's Chief Operating Officer. In that position, she assists the Controller General in providing leadership and vision for the organization and in managing the organization. So to put it mildly, her responsibilities are enormous and we are very fortunate to have her with us today, giving her, us her valuable time. Kate's been at GAO for 33 years in various capacities, which makes her an ideal person to tell us about GAO's origins, history, and help us appreciate the scope of GAO's work. So with that, I hand the floor to you, Kate. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here today. I wanna to thank the American Enterprise Institute and the Lincoln Network for organizing these panels. Uh, we at GAO are very excited to be celebrating 100 years this year, specifically in July is the actual date. 
And we're pleased today to have the opportunity to reach an, an audience and speak about these issues. And it's also great to see some colleagues who we know from their days as staffers on Capitol Hill and Terry Girton with the National Academy of Public Administration on the second panel. So my job today uh, is to take you through a quick history of GAO. Um, I have worked at GAO for a third of its history, as, as Kevin pointed out. Uh, Looks like Kate's video is frozen for the moment. Let's just see if it hashes itself out as Zoom sometimes does. No luck so far. Well, tell you what, why don't we simply hop forward to our second speak. Oh, Kate, you back? I am, can you hear me? You are loud and clear and you're Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know where I cut off. Was I saying something good about you, Tim? Yes. We were fortunate uh, to have you. Yes. Okay. So in addition to being <laughs> GAO's chief quality officer, he is also one of the two executives who's planning our 100-year celebrations, which we're having uh, throughout the year. So when you think of the Government Accountability Office today, first of all, some people still call us the General Accounting Office, uh, but I'll get to that later. Same acronym, but different, different words. Um, you may think of some of the following fun functions that we fill in the written materials that we produce. So most obvious is reports that evaluate federal programs for efficiency, compliance with various legal and regulatory requirements and best practices. And in most cases, those reports are addressed to Congress. You may also think of us as the auditor of the federal government's annual financial statements and the financial auditor of a handful of individual agency financial statements as well. Uh, those who follow uh, federal contracting may think of GAO as the forum that disappointed would-be federal contractors can seek if they feel a federal contract has been inappropriately awarded to one of their competitors. And those who follow the federal budget may be aware of GAO's expertise in appropriations law matters and in their legal opinions, so we're fortunate to have Ada Emanuele Perez here today, and she is an expert in appropriations law, among other things, and has taught GAO's classes on this subject and authored some of GAO's appropriations law decisions. More recently, those who follow GAO's establishment and, extans and expansion of a science and technology uh, capacity and recognition of congressional needs for support in overseeing and legislating on these complex and rapidly evolving issues. In the Controller General's uh, testimony last week before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch, uh, we included information on the growth uh, of the science technology assessment and analytics team and our plans for moving forward. And I know that's a planned topic for our second panel today as well. And I think while it's generally known within the Beltway um, that GAO is positioned within the legislative branch and has a mission to support the Congress in carrying out its constitutional functions with regard to legislation and oversight. Um, those who encounter us mainly through news coverage may not be aware of that positioning and have that function. Um, but I hope that GAO's policy of carrying out our mission in an objective, fact-based, fact and nonpartisan way, and its reputation for doing so is well known, um, along with its core values of accountability, integrity, and reliability. And I'll just take this opportunity to, opportunity to remind everyone of those functions that we fulfill and those values. But many of these current facts about GAO were not always so, uh, and I will take a few minutes to walk you through how we got here. So as Garrett mentioned toward the beginning, the Budget Accounting Act, Budget and Accounting Act created GAO in 1921, and Congress realized the need to control growing government expenditures and debt after World War I. 
And that act transferred certain accounting and debt functions from the Treasury uh, to GAO. Um, wartime spending had driven up the national debt, and Congress saw that it needed more information and better control over expenditures. So that act made GAO independent of the executive branch and gave us a broad mandate to investigate how federal dollars are being spent. Uh, as a side note, another very important innovation in that, in that act required the president to prepare an annual budget for the federal government. After World War II, as government expenditures and programs grew, GAO did as well. Uh, the focus of our work shifted, however, toward helping Congress monitor executive branch agencies, programs, and spending. After the war, uh, GAO and the Congress recognized that we could best serve the Congress by doing broader, more comprehensive audits that focused on the economy and efficiency of government operations. So GAO transferred some of, its, some of its responsibilities like voucher checking to the executive branch. And instead of scrutinizing every single government fiscal transaction, GAO began to review financial controls and management more broadly within federal agencies. In 1950, GAO, um, the 1950s, I should say, GAO established field offices across the United States, uh, recognizing that most federal funds are in fact spent outside of Washington, DC. We also established uh, offices overseas, including in Europe and Asia, uh, including Saigon, recognizing the extensive military spending and presence the United States has overseas. And in 1951, GAO opened up our headquarters building, which we are still in today at 4th and G Northwest. And as a, as a uh, factoid of the time, at the time it opened, GAO was the largest centrally air-conditioned office building uh, in Washington, DC. So GAO's evolution to focusing specifically on government performance started more in the late 1960s when we were asked to start to evaluate the great society programs created by Congress and the president in the Johnson administration. And in 1974, Congress broadened GAO's evaluation role and gave us, gave us greater responsibility in the budget process that's also when we started to recruit people from disciplines like scientists, actuaries, and experts in fields like healthcare, public policy, and computer science. So that act and the transition to performance led GAO to focus primarily on the concept of performance auditing, looking at whether the government is uh, following law and regulation, functioning efficiently, and we started to make recommendations to improve performance. So while we did keep somewhat of an emphasis on financial auditing, the majority of our work then and to today focuses on performance. And in 1972, we published the first publication that later became known as the Government Audit Auditing Standards, the so-called Yellow Book, which sets out principles for financial and performance audit that now organizations at all levels of the government follow. So by the 1980s, GAO was primarily known for reports which focused on government performance. Also in 1984, the Congress passed the Competition and Contracting Act, which formalized the role that GAO's general counsel has in adjudicating federal bid protests regarding contracts. So nevertheless, GAO kept its eye on financial management by the federal government and worked very closely with the Congress uh, to pass the Chief Financial Officers Act in 1990, which formalized and professionalized this function across the federal government. And to this day, GAO remains the auditor of the combined financial statements for the federal government. Uh, but for the last five years or so, we've also issued a report to coincide with those statements, which focuses on the fiscal condition of the federal government today and going out over several decades. So shortly thereafter, we began one of our signature products, the High Risk Series. What this does is identify federal programs that are at high risk of fraud, waste, and mismanagement, or in need of fundamental excuse me, transformation. And we time that new report every year for the beginning of a new Congress, and this year issued it in March. It's been the source of a significant number of GAO's accomplishments in terms of program improvements and financial benefits. But given that it is focused on some of the most intractable challenges facing the federal government, many programs to this day uh, remain on the list or, or come and go depending on what's changing. So in 2004, 
We changed our legal name from the General Accounting Office to the Government Accountability Office. And the, tra the change reflected our agency's expanding role in a growing federal government and focus on performance, accountability, and transparency. So today, our agency, which once checked millions of government vouchers, is a multidisciplinary organization focusing on Congress's toughest audit and evaluation assignments. We look at a wide range of issues, everything from military readiness to opioid addiction, the gig economy, affordable housing, the U.S. Census and food safety, just to mention a small number of those. Um, most recently, Congress has turned to GAO increasingly in the wake of major initiatives and reforms to understand whether they are having the intended effects and to try to get real-time recommendations for course corrections from GAO. So examples include the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 in response to the financial crisis, the Choice Act to allow veterans to receive medical attention outside of the VHA system. They asked us to look at whether the Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act is changing agency behavior and managing IT. And we were asked to look at the effect of reforms on DOD acquisition. And just last year, uh, GAO has started evaluating the largest response to a US national emergency in US history, the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan, and several pieces of related legislation that provided um, appropriations for the pandemic. So, so far we have issued six cross-cutting whole of government reports focusing on those issues and made 72 recommendations focused on the, improving the overall effectiveness of the many different ways that the federal government is trying to respond to the crisis in both public health and the economy. So we are still innovating and responding to current challenges that we in the Congress face. In our second panel, you'll, you'll hear today about how we're innovating and communicating with Congress, the press and the American people, and about our newest team, the Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Team. So I would be remiss if I didn't end with bragging a little bit uh, and mentioning some accomplishments from the past fiscal year. GAO encourages every federal agency to set performance targets and report on meeting them, and we do the same. So we tend to set a number of our recommendations around financial benefits that come from our work and about getting our recommendations implemented. In the fiscal year 2020, we estimate that GAO's work produced about 77.6 billion, I shouldn't say about there, that's pretty precise, 77.6 billion in financial benefits and uh, about 77% of the recommendations that we made were implemented within four years. So Kevin, I'll throw it back to you and wait to any wait for any questions that might come up. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. And for our viewers who may have joined us a little bit late, uh, again, feel free to queue up your questions um, whenever you see fit. And we'll take them during the Q&A session, which will happen after each of our panelists presents. And if you're reaching out to us via Twitter, please tag using the hashtag GAO100. And if you're interested in learning more about GAO's history, uh, out on Twitter, if you go to the GAO100 tag, you will see that I have just posted, click, a link to the web page where GAO has laid out both a short timeline history and also has some deeper institutional resources on the agency and how it started, what it does. All right. With that, let us move to panelist number two, Dr. Tim Bowling. He's going to tell us about GAO's auditing work, which has been a core function of the agency since its inception. He is the chief quality officer at GAO and a managing director of audit policy and quality assurance. So who better to educate us on this GAO function? Tim has been with GAO since 1978 and is a source of immense institutional memory. So with that, take it away, Tim. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. As uh, I was listening to Kate give that very fine uh, history of GAO, I was struck by how much of that history I've actually experienced myself. It's actually slightly alarming. But um, let me just talk a little bit about our audit work. That's, as Kate pointed out, the major part of what we do now. We had originally done much more financial auditing. Now, over 90% falls into our categories of uh, audit work. Um, as 
Kate mentioned, the history of GAO is one of change and growth uh, to meet the ever-expanding needs of the Congress and the American people. As these needs have become increasingly complex, GAO has evolved to meet them with new methodologies and approaches, more sophisticated tools and technologies, and a more diverse and highly trained analyst workforce. We fully expect this train trend of evolution to continue throughout the 21st century. While GAO's audit work is indeed wide ranging, the large majority of this work falls into three general categories of audit work. First is oversight work, which consists of audits designed to determine whether government entities are doing what they are supposed to do, that funds are being spent for their intended purpose, and that applicable laws and regulations are being complied with. That's very basic oversight of federal activities and agencies. Insight work, the second category, includes audits that are designed to determine what policies and programs work and which ones do not. This involves identifying best practices and benchmarking information and looking horizontally across the silos of government and vertically between the levels of government. And our foresight work, which is looking forward as the name implies, this work is designed to identify key trends and emerging challenges before they reach crisis proportions. For example, foresight work covers challenges ranging from the needs of an aging population and the demands of the information age to changing national security threats and significant fiscal imbalances that are currently facing us today. The results of all this work are presented in our reports and in testimonies at congressional hearings. And we testify in the neighborhood of 200 times a year before congressional committee uh, uh, and subcommittee hearings. The majority of our reports, that's over 60%, contain recommendations for agency action and in some cases, suggestions to Congress to provide legislative remedies to existing problems. At the heart of our approach to this work is the ability we have to tailor our audits to address the specific needs of Congress. These needs are generally conveyed to GIO in letters from committees and subcommittee chairs and ranking minority members, or perhaps embodied in legislation which requires us or requests us to do a set of audit work. Our work to meet these needs is performed using a variety, a wide variety, I might say, of methodologies. These range from short-term turnaround uh, engagements and more tightly focused reviews that might result in a set of specific recommendations to an agency head, to broader, more complex analyses resulting in recommendations for government-wide action or perhaps congressional legislation. For example, during the past year, GAO's work has addressed issues ranging from weapon systems to job programs, from the national response to the COVID pandemic to assisting with the nation's economic recovery. It's a very wide spectrum of issues that we will address through these audits. The importance of keeping pace with emerging and rapidly evolving scientific and technological advances, which has been mentioned earlier by Kate, was brought into sharp relief this year by the COVID-19 pandemic. Such advances are transforming multiple sectors of society, including medicine, transportation, communication, and defense. Each development brings both opportunities and potential challenges. The ability of Congress to understand and evaluate such developments will be critical to the US to remain safe, innovative, and globally competitive. Our relatively new science technology assessment and analytics team, which uh, Kate mentioned earlier, is well positioned to assist with this challenge. Its growing portfolio of ongoing and future work includes quantum computing, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies, and the use of artificial intelligence in medical diagnostics. We've also established a state-of-the-art innovation lab that will prototype advanced analytics and emerging technologies to increase the sophistication of our work auditing federal programs and the results of this work that we provide 
for clients. Relatedly, escalating cybersecurity threats, including new and more destructive attacks from around the globe, highlight the critical and persistent need for effective information security work. Our work continues to include the security of federal information systems, uh, critical infrastructure, such as transportation, communications, financial services, and the electric grid. While our performance audits, which I've been describing thus far, are diverse, very diverse, in fact, in the issues they address and the methodologies they employ in addressing them, they all have to meet the same high and exacting quality standards. All of our work must be independent, nonpartisan, objective, and fact-based. To ensure it embodies these values, we have developed a quality assurance framework that all of our engagements must follow. Before a methodology or a product is approved, you must go through a process, go through Kate and go through me, that brings to bear the best thinking of GAO's experts on the issues and disciplines the audit addresses, and must undergo a rigorous fact-checking process to ensure its complete accuracy. The success of this approach to ensuring the accuracy of all of our work is shown by the reputation GAO enjoys and the fact that both sides of the aisle make heavy use of our work. In fact, GAO received requests from 90% of the standing committees of the Congress during the last fiscal year. That includes both sides of the aisle. And I think that's a tribute to our nonpartisan and independent perspective that we bring to this work and the fact that we get it right. As part of our approach to determining the impact and benefits of our work, we've established a set of performance measures including both the financial and non-financial benefits resulting from our work and the percentage of our recommendations that are implemented by the agencies to whom they are made. As an example, since 2002, GAO's work has resulted in close to $2 trillion in financial benefits and more than 24,000 program and operational benefits that have helped change laws, improve public safety and other services, and promote better management throughout the government. Last year, Kate mentioned that our work yielded about $77 billion in financial benefits, which is a return of about $114 for every dollar spent on GAO. So we're, our return on investment is very good. We're a good investment. Through achieving results such as these, GAO, GAO will continue to address the needs of the Congress and provide significant benefits to the American people throughout the coming years. And our commitment and the Comptroller General's commitment, Kate's commitment to these values, to these standards, to this approach, to ensuring the quality of our work is unsenting and there are no exceptions. So I feel very comfortable that we can deliver on that promise. And at that point, I will stop and allow the next speaker to talk, but I'll be happy to answer any questions later on should they arise. Terrific, thank you very much, Tim. Let's move to our third speaker, Edda Emanuela Perez. <clears throat> She's Deputy General Counsel and Chief Ethics Officer in GAO's Office of General Counsel. She's responsible for overseeing the guidance to GAO employees and managers on ethics, conflicts of interest, impairments to independence, and financial disclosure, amongst other things. Put succinctly, one of the important things she does at GAO is to help the agency and its personnel stay firmly rooted in their role as trusted, nonpartisan source for analyses. And it's going to school us on GAO's legal work. Public policy inevitably involves government acting on the basis of law or interpretations thereof, so GAO cannot but help but do a lot of work in this area. So with that, Etta, I give you the virtual floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about GAO's legal authorities and the work that we do for Congress in really helping Congress in its oversight function as well as its constitutional function of the power of the purse. So since GAO's creation um, a century ago, uh, there was an Office of General Counsel established literally on the first day that GAO opened its doors um, to carry out those legal functions. And these functions, again, it's really serving Congress's constitutional prerogatives. Um, all of our work ties back to supporting Congress and maintaining its role um, as one of the three co-equal branches of the government. And what we do is we provide legal analysis and advice 
within GAO to those engagement teams that Kate and Tim described, as well as directly to Congress and Congress's staff. So providing assistance to Congress in its, uh, you know, provide uh, you know, technical assistance in the legal work it does, as well as, for example, helping Congress as it's drafting laws or reviewing laws. So as you all know, the, you know, the, the framers, you know, vested Congress with that power of the purse, providing in the constitution that no money shall be drawn from treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And so again, this is holding the government accountable um, to the will of the people. It provides a key check on the power of the other branches. So in 1921, as, as Kate described, and as uh, you know, Kevin and others have described, Congress created, of course, the General Accounting Office, now, of course, Government Accountability Office. And in that Budget and Accounting Act, it's assisting in discharging those core powers. So as part of that, GAO was given statutory responsibilities to investigate and oversee the use of public money. So for example, we issued then and we issue now uh, decisions on the use of appropriations to both the Congress and the executive branch, uh, such as the Anti-Deficiency Act um, or the Empowerment Control Act. Um, we also perform legal work in the areas of uh, the review of uh, uh, the Congressional Review Act, dealing with regulations that uh, the executive branch uh, issues. And then also in the Federal Vacancies uh, Reform Act, where there are specific conditions that con Congress has set out with respect to the filling of vacancies in the executive branch. And then finally, we of course also provide legal advice and support to our own analysts and auditors uh, in their carrying out of those engagements. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So as, as noted uh, previously by Kate, you know, obviously GAO's functions come from, you know, really the prior functions carried out in the Department of Treasury. There were comptrollers and auditors, um, as well as a comptroller of the Treasury. And those functions uh, really were carrying out that review at that time of really all of, this, all of the funds being spent by the executive branch. So in creating uh, GAO, those functions were transferred to uh, what is now, of course, the uh, statutory position of the Comptroller General. And that among those transferred functions was the function of issuing legal decisions. Now those legal decisions had actually started being rendered um, in, uh, we have records going back to 1817, so very early on in our Republic. Um, you will see that there were uh, le legal decisions on the use of appropriations and the functioning of the executive branch. Um, and so today, we still have that at GAO, the, you know, in those 100 years, that continuing evolution of that body of administrative law. Um, a lot of the legal decisions that you will see that GAO is well known for are, of course, the appropriations law decisions. Um, and that, of course, includes, you know, supporting Congress in the use of funds. So you will see decisions that look at the application of the Anti-Deficiency Act, which governs really the use of appropriated funds, um, mainly looking at the amounts being spent as well as the timing of the spending of those funds. So we issue many decisions on the Anti-Deficiency Act. We also issue decisions under the Empowerment Control Act, where we look at the, the use of the funding by the executive branch, where the president has been given some limited authority to withhold funds for specific purposes. So we issue decisions and have reviews for Congress there. Um, and then finally, we also have with appropriated funds, you will find many decisions that deal with the purpose of the funds. So how can we use these funds in the federal government? And those will range from you know, very broad uh, programs and looking at an agency carries, um, carries out the use of that funding to even just very particular items or very particular services that uh, the agencies are trying to purchase. And so we will issue decisions there. Um, GAO, uh, in addition, for many years, had the authority to administratively and conclusively settle all the claims against the United States. And when you think about some of the very early uh, decisions that we issued that you will see, uh, you know, uh, that have been published, of course, you'll see GAO looking at very specific vouchers that were submitted to it um, for many years, looking at the use of the money with respect to very particular purchases. Um, that, of course, has evolved now to really a different functioning because GAO uh, no longer has the really the responsibility for looking at those specific vouchers, except, of course, when we're doing our engagements or if we receive a request on the use of appropriated funds, we may be looking at some very particular expenses. Um, 
Today, GAO still has what we call an account settlement authority. And that is, even though we're not doing the specific claims, we do perform our duty with respect to that availability of appropriations. Um, we issue, of course, also decisions, um, and we also write a, the Red Book, which is a multi-volume treatise on appropriations law. It's very well recognized uh, throughout the government and by the courts, the federal courts. Um, and it really does recognize the, you know, really 100 years of expertise that GEO has developed in appropriations law. Um, the, the other uh, types of uh, things that we do with respect to appropriations law, of course, are to provide that assistance, not only to Congress, but to the executive branch when we get, you know, requests for informal uh, advice or assistance in terms of, you know, particular issues that come up where we can provide advice on, you know, issues that we've already uh, determined or, you know, really recommending to the Congress and to agencies how they might want to analyze a particular um, issue. Um, let me talk a little bit about just two of the other functions, uh, the Congressional Review Act and the Federal Vacancies Reform Act. So under the Congressional Review Act, again, this is another example of how GAO's legal functions really support Congress's oversight. Um, the Congressional Review Act requires GAO to report on major rules that agencies make, including summaries of the procedural steps taken by agencies. Um, since federal agencies are, are required to submit a copy to both the Congress and GAO before rules can take effect, those are some of the procedural steps that we look at to see if the agencies have submitted that. And then, of course, if Congress um, requests a legal decision um, with respect to compliance with this law, we also provide that to the Congress. Under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act, um, another, again, key to supporting Congress's oversight function um, that act provides for the temporary filling of vacant uh, executive agency positions that require presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. And so under that act, agent, an acting officer can serve in that vacant position uh, generally for no longer than 210 days. And there are certain adjustments that can be made um, if the president submits a nomination to fill the position. And there are some other specified circumstances. Uh, agencies are required to report to Congress and GAO um, information about a vacancy immediately upon the occurrence of you know, various events specified. And we also report then to con certain congressional committees um, on uh, whether an acting officer has served longer than is permitted by the act. So we receive and record information with respect to the filling of those vacancies. I'd like to turn um, to our procurement law function, um, which again has been mentioned previously. And it, it may be a function that many uh, in the audience are familiar with. It certainly is a function that you will hear about in the press as well. So the bid protest function um, is a little bit younger than our other legal functions because they've only been around for 95 years, right? So that's, uh, you know, really just for the first five years, we didn't have bid protest, but we did get a request. And the first one that we got um, was in 1925. And just let me quickly tell you about that. Um, what happened there was there was a letter we received and they literally said, we're protesting the award of a contract. And it involved um, the, a company called Outer Car Sales and Service Company. And they made trucks. And the Panama uh, Canal, Canal Department was purchasing five motor trucks. And they awarded it to another company. Um, and it was at a price that was $300 more than what the auto car company had bid. Uh, so they said, hey, why, can't, why haven't we gotten this? Um, you know, our price was actually cheaper. GAO wrote to the Panama Canal Department and requested you know, information. That department said, well, actually, the lowest price was the company we awarded it to based on the specifications. In other words, that other company didn't meet the specifications. So we issued that decision and basically denied the protest. The auto car company sent us another letter and said, you know what? There's something that you don't know. And that is those specifications, they were too strict. The Panama Canal Company really made the requirements so strict that we couldn't meet them and in effect restricting competition. So if that sounds familiar, that's because that is part of that federal procurement process. One of the purposes is that the government is going to issue you know, requests for contracts and not restrict it unless it's you know, either legally required to or unless it's necessary. So we ended up concluding in that case that the first company was right that the Panama Canal Company had actually restricted it too much. And therefore we wrote back to the Panama Canal Company uh, department and we recommended that they revise their purchasing methods to increase competition. Um, so as you are probably thinking, 
you've probably seen engagement reports as well as bid protests that really go along that same theme. Um, so in 1984, uh, Congress passed the Competition and Contracting Act, which we refer to as SECA, uh, where we have the statutory authority to resolve bid protests and promulgate bid protest regulations. Um, but we had already been building for many decades that, you know, that, that particular um, you know, case law dealing with the award of contracts and competition. Um, just to give you a statistic here in fiscal year 2020, our procurement law division closed 2024 bid protest and we produced 545 published bid protest decisions. So it definitely is still remains a very, uh, very uh, uh, you know, highly used and very busy area of, uh, in our legal office. Um, so probably is in me members of your, of your audience are very, you know, most familiar with the engagement uh, work that we do as mentioned by, by Tim and Kate. Um, so just to tell you, kind of round this out, tell you a little bit about uh, our Office of General Counsel's role as engagement counsel. So what we do there is we work as members of every engagement team. So all those, all those teams preparing products, doing this audit work, we provide the legal advice and assistance to carry out that work. So for example, we help establish what is the legal framework for a program that GO is reviewing? What is the legal framework with respect to the laws that Congress has passed, the regulations that agencies have issued, as well as the very particular decisions that could involve the use of appropriate funds, or that could be what are the various regulatory authorities? What did Congress expect an agency to do with respect to carrying out a program? So we have lawyers who are part of every team to be, really be able to help present that and help analyze uh, the legal underpinnings of that work. Um, again, in, a, in, a, in order to really enable Congress to have the legal analysis um, and advice that it needs in its oversight function of these programs. Um, it's it's a, a part that we do provide um, a lot of resources to, and it's really part also of that multidisciplinary approach um, that GAO takes in you know, conducting its engagement work. Um, so in addition, we of course also have an internal operations unit as, as every organization would with respect to a GAO, but really this encompasses all of the work that our Office of General Counsel does. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, uh, Kevin, uh, you know, for our next panelists and look forward to any questions your audience may have. Thank you. Edda, thank you very much. Let's move to our final speaker, Elise Bean. She does not work for GAO. Rather, she was a customer or beneficiary of GAO when she served in Congress, and she was there for about 30 years, helping Senator Carl Levin engage in rigorous oversight. Today, Elise directs the Washington office of the Levin Center, which is based at Wayne State Law School in Detroit, and which promotes bipartisan, fact-based legislative oversight. Elise has trained hundreds of congressional staff in oversight techniques and is the, and is the author of this book, Financial exposure, Carl Evans' Senate investigations into finance and tax abuse. I think it's an important thing to remember that oversight is not just oversight of the government, but also of the private sector. Elise is going to explain the value of GAO's work to congressional oversight in her experience. With that, I turn it to you, Elise. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, thank you to the Lincoln Network and the American Enterprise Institute for having this event. I am just delighted to celebrate GAO's history and its future. So as you mentioned, uh, I spent my career doing oversight and we use GAO all the time. Just like you talked about, I, it was very frequent for me. And that's because GAO's superpower is the ability to investigate, analyze, and formulate complex facts. So I'm talking about the careful work needed to build confidence that we know something is a fact. We know in today's world, that's not easy. It's very difficult. And the fact that GAO can produce reliable and widely accepted facts is really important. It's not easy, but it's critical to understanding particular problems and also to developing solutions to those problems. The Supreme Court has said in the past that fact finding is inherent in the legislative process. Uh, if you want to make decisions about laws, spending taxpayer dollars, approving nominations, taking military actions, wouldn't it be good to have informed decisions that actually look at those facts? So what I'd like to do is give you three examples um, to talk about uh, how GAO can help Congress 
uh, reach those factual conclusions. The first one has to do with credit cards. So uh, way back when, Center 11 wanted to look at unfair credit card practices, but there were a lot of problems in doing that. There was a lack of data about credit cards. Uh, they were very complicated. There wasn't a good understanding about how credit cards work. Uh, even more than that, we had credit card companies that were uncooperative and worried about if they disclosed information about their credit cards, that they would be put at a disadvantage with their competitors. So they were very, very wary. We asked GAO to step in and help us just get some basic information about credit cards. And what they did is they gathered information on six of the most popular credit cards at the time. And it took them an entire year to do it. Why? Because all those credit card companies were so wary. What GAO ended up doing in a very innovative way is they um, uh, found a third party that everybody trusted. All the credit card companies sent their information to that third party. The third party then took off the name of the credit card company and used instead company A, B, or C. And they were able to do that in such a way and then turn over the information to GAO, the GAO could still do the analysis that all of us wanted. And so they were able to, they actually put out a 125 page report as they sometimes do. And they found such facts as there were at the time, this was in 2006, there were 690 million credit cards with debt totaling $1.8 trillion to give all of us a sense of how big that problem, the, the issue was involving credit cards. Uh, they found that credit card companies were enga engaging in unilateral rate hikes and that they were imposing penalty interest rates of over 30%. They found that the average late fee was $34, a maximum of $39. They found that the credit card companies were charging people to pay their uh, bills by telephone, giving them a fee of $5 to $15 each time they tried to pay their bill. They, they were making people pay to pay. Uh, and they found that the average credit card companies, that their profits were more than double the average profits at a commercial bank. So this was a very lucrative industry. All of those were facts that we did not know until... Uh, GAO issued that report. And in fact, it was downloaded over 10,000 times in a very short period of time, became their most popular report at the time. And of course, we took advantage of that. We issued a press release, trying to make it a little less dry, a little more uh, sort of jazzed up and to get interest in the issue. Uh, to make a long story short, we were able to uh, get Congress to pass the legislation along with a lot of other people working on it, bipartisan bill, the Credit Card Act of 2009. Uh, and it did things like uh, it st uh, that legislation stopped the ability of credit cards companies to impose unilateral rate hikes on people if people had played by the rules and did what they were supposed to. They, uh, the legislation required 45 days notice before a higher rate kicked in and made sure that that new rate only applied to future debt and not to past debt as had been the practice. It included a limit on over the limit fees. Uh, you could only impose those fees for three times in a row and not for endless months as had been the practice. And they stopped that whole thing of charging you a fee to pay your bill. So GAO played a really critical role in getting those very important reforms that helped hundreds of millions of families across the country. All right, second example, federal contractors who don't pay their taxes. This was an issue that was really important to Senator Coleman, a Republican from Minnesota who was our ranking Republican on the permanent subcommittee on investigations at the time. And he had heard about reports about federal contractors who were getting paid with taxpayer dollars and yet had substantial unpaid taxes. So they couldn't bother to pay their taxes, even though they're getting paid with taxpayer dollars. And we also heard that the federal tax levy program, which was a response to that, that program was like, all right, if there's money going out the door to a contractor and they owe a lot of taxes, let's grab part of that money and make sure it goes to their tax debt before it leaves um, the federal government. Uh, the rumor was that that program was not very efficient. It was wrapped up in red tape. Now, if you think about this tax issue, uh, the IRS is bound by law 
to be very careful about the information it gives out about particular taxpayers. Uh, most uh, congressional committees cannot get access to tax information. But GAO can be an intermediary. They have gained the trust and respect of the IRS, and the IRS allows them to access tax information. So what happened here to help uh, Senator Coleman's uh, inquiry is GAO developed a methodology to analyze federal contractors with outstanding tax debt. And it took them a while, but they figured it out, uh, and they began to apply it in a very efficient way using uh, the tax uh, deadbeat list against the list of contractors who, uh, who uh, were getting paid. Uh, and we ended up in, in the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation holding six hearings over seven years on this project. And GAO was the lead uh, witness in each one of those hearings. So in 2004, GAO issued a report that found 27,000 DOD contractors had unpaid taxes totaling $3 billion. 2005, GAO looked at civilian agencies and they found there were 33,000 contractors that owed taxes totaling $3.3 billion. And they went on in 2007, uh, they looked at Medicare healthcare providers, 21,000 of them owed taxes of $1.3 billion. And in fact, they found out that HHS, which oversee, uh, was, uh, oversees the Medicare um, healthcare program, uh, had refused to implement the tax levy program at all. So none of their, those contractors were getting reviewed at all uh, with their unpaid taxes. So those and other reports that GAO did profiled individual contractors who were engaged in abusive tax practices, as well as these large numbers about figuring how many contractors we're talking about, how much money we're talking about. So um, as a result of that, uh, GAO also identified a number of problems with the tax levy program. And we concentrated for such a period of time with GAO's assistance that we were able to do a lot of different kinds of reforms. So for example, the first thing that happened is uh, the executive branch itself set up a task force. They had people from uh, the IRS, from DOD, from GSA, from Treasury, and they got together and they started to look at this tax levy program. What can we do to improve it? The first thing they figured out is that DOD had developed a software program to automate putting in the information from their tax, from their contract payments going out compared to the um, IRS's uh, a list of people that owed taxes. Uh, so they automated that. And they found they had only done it for one of I think it was 16 different contract programs. Well, they expanded them to all of them in DOD and then exported it to other agencies as well. Uh, eventually, so that task force did amazing work uh, without any legislation to just try to improve on a bureaucratic basis how that tax levy program was working. Uh, then we passed a law HHS had refused to implement the tax levy program. Well, we gave them a deadline and there were going to be certain consequences that they didn't. HHS gave in and they applied the tax levy program to Medicare payments. That was hundreds of billions of dollars every year. And all of a sudden those uh, contractors and healthcare providers all of a sudden had to think about actually paying their taxes. Uh, then we had a regulation uh, that was developed in the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, that required anybody who wanted to bid on a federal contract had to disclose if they had un unpaid taxes of at least $3,000. Well, that encouraged those contractors to start paying their tax bills. And by 2010, after this long effort, we had found that the tax levy program collections had gone from less than a million dollars in 2004, by 2010, the total was $115 million. From $1 million to $115 million, just getting those people that owe their taxes and getting paid with taxpayer dollars to step up to the plate and do their fair share in terms of paying their taxes. Uh, the last example I want to give you has to do with U.S. shell companies that have hidden owners. Uh, we had heard reports of U.S. companies with hidden owners being involved in lots of different kinds of wrongdoing. 
money laundering, terrorism, uh, trafficking, financial fraud, tax cheats. Uh, and there was anecdotal evidence that the 50 states setting up U.S. companies really had no idea who was behind them. They didn't ask and they didn't know. So we went to GL and we said, you know, is that true? Think about it. if you work for Congress, are you going to go to all 50 states, analyze those laws, as Etta was talking about, to figure out what those laws really mean? It's really beyond the capacity of most congressional staffers to do that kind of work. But GAO, that's their superpower. It took them a whole year, but they went to all 50 states, analyzed the laws in those 50 states, and found, in fact, it was true. They were setting up companies, in fact, two million a year. And they didn't know who was behind those companies, had no idea whatsoever. Set them up, unleash them on our country, the rest of the world, no idea what was going on. And because it was GAO who had done that work, people felt that it was reliable. And it has been the go-to report on that area of, uh, of concern for the last 14 years. Nobody's even attempted to duplicate the work that GAO did. And in fact, today, in 20, uh, on January 1 of 2021, Congress passed a new law to set up a beneficial ownership registry, which for the first time will require, about a year from now, uh, will first, for the first time, require all U.S. entities with certain exceptions uh, to disclose who are the real people, the human beings that are behind those companies that are running them. So I hope you can take from these three examples that GEO can help Congress find the facts, even very complicated facts. And because of that, they can help Congress bridge the divides to come up with a nonpartisan, widely accepted facts that can provide the foundation for Congress taking action. And because of that, GEO can help Congress produce meaningful reforms. So, GAO, I salute you. I salute the work that you do. And thank you. I hope you continue doing this work for the next 100 years. Kevin? Thank you very much, Elise. We've concluded with our panelists' presentation, which was dynamite. Thank you all. And we have a slew of questions that have come in. It's about 2.10. We've got a hard stop at 2.30. So to get through all these questions, we may have to move to a sort of speed round, but we'll see. Uh, so here, let me queue up the first question, and whomever uh, would like to answer, go right ahead. Uh, we have a questioner asking about Congress. Do you all find Congress responsive to foresight analysis, or are they are more responsive to analysis based on hindsight? Uh, what do you think, panelists? Should I take that one? Yeah, okay. uh, thank, you, Ke thank you, thank you, Kevin. That, that's a it's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's a, a human trait that it's easier to focus on what's right in front of us rather than something that's several years down the road. But I would say that um, at the committee level, there is a strong appetite for looking uh, further out and to try to understand uh, the policy, fiscal, human, um, international implications of decisions that Congress makes today or fails to make today in, in, in the a case of, of action not being taken. And uh, between GAO and um, our, uh, our uh, sister agency, the Congressional Budget Office, which also does terrific work on fiscal and other implications that are uh, more forward looking, uh, we do continue to get asked to do that kind of work. And uh, at least I see it as something that is weighed when Congress is deciding whether or not uh, to make a change in the way that it governs and oversees. And certainly we, with regard to our recommendations to federal agencies, as I mentioned, you know, somewhere in the three quarters of those typically get, um, get uh, uh, implemented over time. And many of those are forward looking to solve problems that we've identified either that are occurring now or are likely to occur in the absence of of, of uh, action by an executive branch agency. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Next question is an interesting one uh, on digitization of government. We heard earlier references to the fact that GAO, you know, way back when would have to go through paper vouchers. And for those of you who've had long terms at GAO, you've no doubt experienced 
as government has moved away from hard paper copy, uh, now we're into the cloud. How has digitization affected the work that GAO does in general? I'll start out and any of my panelists, please uh, fill in. So, uh, you know, the fact that we've all been at least uh, at GAO um, working from home uh, for now more than 13 months uh, means that there's enough digitization out there that we can do an awful lot of our work uh, using electrons and communicating with each other in the very manner that we're doing today. So uh, we have been able to carry forth a lot of that oversight, insight, and foresight work that Tim mentioned even in um, an environment where we are not physically together in the office um, or uh, able to meet face-to-face -face with a lot of other human beings, which is a, a way that we typically um, do our work. So we're benefiting from that. Now, um, uh, there are changes we've had to make in the way that we do our work because we cannot be in site and do things like on-site uh, case studies, which are a very bread and butter aspect to some of the kinds of work that we do. And so we are anxious when possible to get back to start doing that kind of work again. Now, on the other hand, uh, the digitization has allowed for very much more sophisticated approaches to analysis and modeling and uh, is really very important to doing things like analyzing large data sets and drawing implications from them. And as we're here, here as we will hear in the second panel, uh, our innovation lab essentially depends on digitization of, of government data. And of course, they'll wrap up by saying that the Congress itself has done enormous work to support that with things like requiring standing up of USA spending.gov and uh, the new taxpayer right to know, all of which requires federal agencies to make um, digitally useful data available to the public on a regular basis. Thank you. Uh, this looks like a question perhaps for Tim. Could you clarify the difference between auditing as in following the money versus performance auditing? Okay, uh, I think one way to look at that is financial audits versus performance audits. Financial audits are auditing the way our finances in the government are managed. They are managed according to very clear and rigorous rules about how you account for the money coming in, the way it's spent, where it goes out. And those rules are quite clear and generally fairly unambiguous. We do a, a less than 10% of our work on that, but we still do uh, work auditing the, the books of federal agencies and the federal government as a whole. Uh, the rest of it, it, most of the rest of it, is uh, what we call performance audit, which is a very wide range of uh, methodologies and approaches to answering the questions Congress is interested in. Um, the three examples that we heard from our other panelists uh, all are uh, the sorts of things we would do as performance audits. Um, most of the oversight, insight, and foresight work is. Uh, done as a performance audit, we will ask a question, Congress will actually ask the question, we will digest the question that they're interested in and come up with a way to express that so that it could actually be analyzed by one of our teams. And then we put that together in a methodology that would allow us to answer that question appropriately and usefully to the Congress. And all of those questions are different. All of those methodologies are different. You spend a lot of time at the early stages, and Kate knows this very well, she oversees those meetings, uh, trying to make sure that we've come up with the appropriate methodology to answer the question as efficiently and accurately as possible. And that is kind of at the heart of every performance audit we do. So there's a wide range of them. They're all somewhat different, and it does result in most of our financial and non-financial benefits and provides a great service, I think, if I may say so, to the uh, congressional sources. All right, thank you. Uh, I believe this one is for Edda. How often does the GAO Red Book get updated and who writes the funny animal stories in it? 
<laughs> for those, for those that don't know, the, the Red Book has some wonderful illustrations of instances where agencies were wondering if they could spend money in a certain way. So I believe there was like a forestry agency that um, had an issue with woodpeckers tearing up uh, a bridge in a woods and they yes. wondered if they could use appropriated funds to buy guns to blast the woodpeckers. Yes. And the GAO had to respond to that. But the, the, the Red Book apparently has on any number of these animal stories. So yes, we do. That, that's the famous marauding woodpeckers decision, um, which is what we literally call them in the decision. Um, we, we actually update the Red Book um, every couple of years. Um, and so what we do is, you know, we try to do an annual update where we will look at what decisions we've issued in the, in the past year, and then go in and try to, you know, let people know, okay, here's some, if there's any changes, any updates, anything new that, uh, that people should know, we put that into an, an annual update uh, document. Um, and then every couple of years, we try to go back and say, okay, do we need to rewrite a, a full chapter or volume? So that's a continuous uh, project. Um, you know, the, the, the animal cases, the sad thing is that most of the animals that are in our red book and our decisions, they're either dead or about to be killed. Um, so, um, but we do try to have a sense of humor. We do try to find, you know, decisions where we can, you know, try to make the point with a little bit of humor in the red book, because it is, it's a thousands of pages in, in the treatise. And what we have found is that um, while we, of course, take our work very seriously, there are some very funny uh, expenditures that are either proposed or have been carried out. So we try to try to identify those. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the marauding woodpeckers. Uh, question for the panel. How can GAO increase its recommendation implementation rate, which person on Twitter believes is around 75%? And this individual also notes that um, somebody at Deloitte suggested that GAO Put deadlines on agency recommendations to see if that might improve the timeliness. Not sure who wants to take that. Uh, why don't I start and hand it to Tim? So th this is a question we've heard before, Kevin. You know, why not put deadlines on? And it's something we've thought about. And should our clients be interested in having us do that? We can have a conversation about it. But in, res in, in, in over overall, trying to get our recommendations implemented at a higher rate. We've, there's two new things that we've done in the past few years. Uh, the, the first is we worked with Congress to develop something called the GAOIG Act, which requires every federal agency that has an, an unimplemented GAO or Inspector General recommendation hanging out there to identify that in their annual budget submission and say something about the status of what is what's going on with that. So we we're, we're making that making that very plain for the Congress what what recommendations have been implemented and what haven't. Um, the second thing we've done is start writing annual letters to all the major agencies, identifying our priority recs. So there are lots of recs we made, but there are some that we think are particularly important to efficiency, safety, compliance with law that should be at the top of every agency heads list. And we send those out every year, make those available to Congress, make those available uh, to the public. With regard to putting a time frame on, you know, that might have some positive effects, it might also have some negative effects. You know, we, we know that that um, working in the government is an, is a complicated thing and getting change in an executive, executive branch agency can take time, particularly if it's a difficult problem to solve. And there are times that we've seen a recommendation take 10 years, but it still got implemented. We just happened to, to measure it at four years because we think that's a reasonable time frame for something to have happened if it is going to happen. Tim, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, just that uh, you're at that last uh, point is very valid. And what we did was take uh, our historical average for how long it took to get them done. And basically it shows that if they haven't been implemented in four years, the odds are, are very small. They will be not impossible. As the example you said, some are implemented after 10 years, but Four years is sort of where we feel uh, we have the momentum, there's the political will, and the, and the importance of the issues is at, at the forefront. And that allows us to sort of put the pressure on them, uh, on the agencies to focus on them more immediately. And we also do that by contacting the agencies every year, at least once a year, and asking them directly what their progress is on each of our recommendations. 
and we make sure they give us an answer and we write it down. If the Hill wants to know, we have an answer for them as well. And, and we put it on our website, Tim. Yes, we have a website. <laughs> Agencies can come directly and look at it and say, oh my gosh, we still haven't implemented those recommendations and you made those two years ago, we better get going. Uh, and once we have done this with all this uh, sort of additional information and publicity, if you will, uh, the interest that the agencies have shown in, I, I suppose, guarding their reputations and getting those uh, recommendations implemented uh, has grown quite a bit. And I think that's been a very effective tool in recent years. If I could just add something, I would say part of the puzzle as well is to get Congress to work on this more because um, oversight is sometimes thought of as a secondary um, duty, um, you know, legislate first, spending next, and then sort of oversight is lower down on the agenda. But if you think about it, oversight is you don't need a new law. You just need to get something done that's already been identified as a problem. So I think GAO working with uh, Congress is another way to get those things done. Yes, I, I completely agree. That uh, has been in the last several years a particularly uh, effective and fruitful partnership. All right, thank you both. Uh, another question off of Twitter. GAO, GAO sends detailees to support congressional committees. How many of these are there? And how has this function changed over time? And how are these staffers typically allocated today? Uh, I think I'll take that one <laughs> as the former director of congressional relations in GAO. So I can speak to at least how we've been doing this for around uh, 11 years. Um, GAO does uh, respond to requests from committees only, uh, not to member offices. By law, we can provide details, details to committees, not to member offices. Um, and we do respond to the majority and the minority. Uh, you know, of course, every um, person that we put on the Hill is a person that's not working on one of those projects that Elise talked about. So we, we try to be careful and we generally keep it uh, at the 15 to 20 at uh, any given time um, and try to be fair allocating between the House and the Senate and majority and minority over time. Um, so that's essentially the approach. It's, it's more of an art uh, than a science. Um, but at the moment, I believe we have around 20 of the GAO staff working on uh, committee details of some kind. And uh, they find it to be a very useful experience in terms of getting a congressional perspective on the work. And of course, you know, our staff's um, ability to uh, work well, to write well, and to analyze is generally useful to the committees as well. All right. We're down to about four minutes left, so I'm gonna rattle through these questions as fast as I can to satisfy our audience. Um, from Twitter, an individual has suggested the idea of perhaps changing GAO's funding model uh, to be shared by the 12 appropriation subcommittees to match oversight capacity to the growth of government. I think the idea is that certain committees use GAO more heavily than others and perhaps you know they should portion some budget authority in that direction. Is this something that you guys have thoughts on? Uh, I don't think we've been approached with that recommendation, Kevin. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, we've been funded by the legislative branch subcommittees for a long time. However, what I will say uh, that we have seen a lot more of in recent years that I think is responsive to the issue that the questioner raises is getting special appropriations in, relate, uh, in relation to emergency oversight um, uh, situations that the Congress finds itself in. So, in, the, um, in 2017 and 2019, with regard to the disasters that had occurred in those years or shortly before, there were, of course, supplemental appropriations passed. And in both of those, there was additional appropriation money made available, not through the legislative branch, but in that supplemental, supplemental appropriation for GAO to focus exclusively on um, reviewing uh, the, the disaster programs run by the federal government. And that is exactly the same model that we are seeing with regard to the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, which have a special appropriation for GAO to do our oversight. All right. Uh, <clears throat> very good, very good. Uh, GAO, committee requests versus member requests. 
Does GAO need to respond to individual members? And can GAO respond to all members asking questions or are additional resources necessary? I'll, I'll take, I'll start that one too, Kevin. Uh, I'll, I'll, do you want to go ahead, Tim? No, no, no that's all right. You, fin you finish up for me then. <clears throat> we have a set of protocols for working with the Congress because generally speaking, the amount of requests that we would receive would uh, exceed our ability to respond in a timely fashion with the resources that we have. So our priorities set out in those protocols and agreed to by the House and Senate majority and minority uh, is um, that those uh, those reports that are uh, set out in law are our first priority. Generally, those are, of course, by their very nature, bipartisan, bicameral, and often have a specific date by which GAO much, must produce a report. Um, our second priority is for chairs or ranking members, again, we're bipartisan, so we treat them the same, of committees that have jurisdiction on the questions that are being asked. And uh, for the last uh, several decades, um, responding to those two priorities has used the majority of GAO's resources. With regard to helping individual members, though, we do a lot of briefing and making our experts available um, on any work that we've completed or where we have general knowledge. We're very open to talking with members and staff uh, on answering those kinds of questions. And as Elise and Kevin has mentioned, uh, we have a lot of expertise on a variety of questions and often can provide, can be helpful to um, individual member offices in that way. All right, and it looks like this will be the last question of the bunch. GAO reports a savings of over $100 for each dollar of its budget. To what extent is that number scalable with additional resources? That's a very interesting question. Uh, over time, it has gone up. Our return on investment has improved as our appropriations have improved. Um, now, usually the uh, reports that yield these financial benefits aren't issued the same year we get a specific appropriation. So there is a something of a lag. It's a little hard to say if you give us, you know, 100 million more dollars, we will return to 140 million dollars, that type of thing. But over time, yes, uh, over time, our appropriations have gone up and our financial benefits that we turn to the American taxpayers have gone up as well. Our um, priorities for our budget request last year and this year are focused in the areas of healthcare, cybersecurity and defense, some of the areas that are um, most expensive for the federal government, where most of the budget goes and where we see some uh, very um, specific risks. Obviously, we're, we've asked for more money. We hope we get it. And we hope that we're able to uh, focus on those issues and other issues of priority for congressional committees um, going forward. All righty. Well, thank you. We have hit 231. And at this point, it's my duty to thank you all. You've given us almost two hours of your extremely valuable time. You've hit us with a lot of extremely educational material and for that we're thankful so thank you kevin you thank, very you. Welcome. thank you thank you very much so i will now uh suggest my panelists uh to feel free to liberate yourself from zoom uh and turn off your cameras and your microphones and i'm going to hand the ball over to zach craves of the lincoln network my partner in setting up this event and who honestly has done most of the work to make this really important event happen. Zach, to you. Thanks, Kevin. That was a great wonky panel. I love the questions at the end. And yeah, I'd like to throw a shout out to you and AEI for helping put this on. We couldn't have done it without you and we're excited to be to be partnered. And uh, you know, it's great to collaborate again. I know we teamed up on uh, a lot of fun stuff back when we were both at Art Street. And now we're going to just go ahead and get uh, right into our second panel. So I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, first, we have Chuck Young, Managing Director of Public Affairs at GAO, who has a lot of great insights. Uh, he'll be sharing with us. We've got Dr. Tim Persons, who's the Chief Scientist at GAO and uh, one of the Managing Directors of the uh, STAA team. Uh, We've also got Marcy Harris, co-founder and CEO of Popbox, who uh, I enjoy collaborating with quite a lot. 
on some of our uh, congressional and democratic reform work uh, here at the Lincoln Network. And finally, we've got uh, Teresa Gerton, who's the president and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration, which is also which is a uh, congressionally chartered entity that played a, a big role in uh, some of the debate around building science and technology capacity uh, in congressional support agencies, uh, and did a, you know a really thorough report uh, a couple of years ago uh, on these very questions. Uh, so we're excited to hear from our panel. First, we're going to open it up for each speaker to have a, a brief presentation uh, talking about their perspective. And then, uh, you know, slightly different from the uh, uh, earlier panel, we're going to have a little bit more kind of open discussion in the middle. And then we're going to go again to audience questions at the end. So please remember to uh, submit your questions either on the YouTube chat or on Twitter with the hashtag uh, GIL 100, and I'll be looking forward to uh, taking on your questions at the end and, and bringing it up at the panel. So first, uh, I'd like to start with Chuck. Uh, if you're here, I know you've got some slides, which I'm happy to share, or if you've got them uh, to share a screen as well, uh, let me know what, what works best for you. Okay. Thanks, Zach. Let me see if I can uh, share them, and uh, I'll call them up. All right, can you hear me okay? All right. Looks like it's coming through great. Great. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for uh, having me, uh, Zach. Thanks uh, to you, to Lincoln, to AEI for doing this event on uh, GAO's uh, 100th and giving people an opportunity to, uh, to learn more about what GAO does and uh, um, the nonpartisan fact-based kind of work we do. That's really the... The, the focus of public affairs, right, at GAO, we're always trying to make sure people uh, see the work um, and understand it. Uh, it is uh, doesn't do us any good to spend a, a month or more than a year working on a report to have it sit on the shelf. Uh, we want to make sure it's seen. We want to make sure it's read. Uh, and um, uh, we want to uh, be able to... Um, uh, do that in an information age in which the way that people access and consume information is changing so dramatically and has changed so much. You know, uh, um, there are so many platforms um, that people now choose to get their information from. Um, and uh, back when I, I have a master's in mass communication, that definition of mass communication doesn't even exist anymore. They don't even, the school I went to doesn't even offer that because mass communications has been blown up into so many different um, ways that people are choosing to get their information. So we're trying to make sure that we uh, keep up with that and wherever people are uh, accessing GAO reports, they have an opportunity to find, accessing information, they have an opportunity to find our work. So one of the things I wanna talk about is our science and tech spotlights. Tim Persons, our chief scientist is on and he's gonna talk um, uh, later about our um, team that specifically does science and tech work. But, you know, there's been a, a hunger on the part of uh, the Congress to uh, to ensure that they are staying um, abreast of uh, new developments in these fields. And so one of the things we wanted to make sure we were doing was at answering um, high-level quick questions about what, whatever the science or tech topic might be. Um, so uh, Tim's team uh, working with us in public affairs, we put together these two pagers called Spotlights to give uh, members, members of the public, media, anybody who's interested a quick overview of um, um, what the topic might be and what the policy considerations are. So this is an example of one that uh, we did on uh, deep fakes um, as these were coming out in the news. Again, keeping it High level, this is just an introduction. The, the GAO audit work, uh, tech assessments, whatever it might be, um, will dive down as deep as the uh, reader wants to go. But this overview, uh, we try to keep short, we try to keep it timely, something that uh, is in um, the public's consciousness, is in front of members of Congress. You know, uh, deep fakes were getting a lot of publicity at the time that the uh, we issued this one last year, and action-oriented, talking about what are the steps that people can take, um, that policymakers can take, what could they be looking at 
as possibilities. Um, so some of the others we've done have been on uh, vaccine safety, on blockchain, on uh, COVID-19 testing, uh, hypersonic weapons. These are just some of the examples because, you know, we recognize that the members um, are just like uh, anybody else um, in terms of uh, uh, the media and the public and uh, the members are being inundated with information 24 seven, a lot of information. Um, so how do we um, A, bring value to that? And one way is of course, nonpartisan fact-based information, uh, but also respect the busy reader, um, not dumping a hundred page PDF on them every time or 200 pages or whatever, you know, and recognizing that um, uh, we have that for anybody who wants to dig deep into the subject matter, but giving them a quick overview as well. So, uh, um, so this is what the science and tech spotlights are doing. And I know Tim will be able to talk some more about those. And then we have fast facts because, you know, for every audit report or testimony, and we put out more than 700 a year, um, <clears throat> it used to be we would have nothing but this highlights page. But over the years, the highlights page uh, became pretty dense. We were putting a lot of information. It started to grow from more than a page to two pages. Um, and uh, again, not as well designed for the busy reader, particularly the busy reader who's coming on that phone. Because this is, uh, as we track it on Google Analytics, more and more people are trying to access our work on mobile devices. Um, it's now over 50% of the people coming to government websites that are coming from mobile devices. And it's about to cross that for GAO specifically. So um, we wanted to make sure that they could, again, anybody can access that information very quickly. So we developed Fast Facts, which is a very quick online summary for every single report and testimony we issue. Plain language, um, and in fact, just this year, received an award from the Center for Plain Language, because too often, uh, if you've read enough GAO reports, you know, you sometimes got to read through that audit language more than once to really figure out what is the bottom line message. But this is an effort to get make sure that message is out there in terms of what are the key things that people should know about this work, make sure it's mobile friendly, make sure there's some kind of a visual with it that helps tell the story and, and keep it brief, keep it short. So um, you get that quick introduction um, to what this audit work is about. Um, because too often we did usability testing before we did this with um, congressional staff, with journalists, with uh, people from think tanks who said, you've given me a lot of great information, um, but um, in today's world, um, I need you to tell me what the bottom line is fast. So I know, does this interest me? And if it does, I'm, then I'm going to invest the time to dig even deeper. So um, the uh, science and tech spotlights and the fast facts are two ways we do that. And then, of course, um, in this environment, as I mentioned, if you are accessing and consuming information on any of these platforms, uh, we want to make sure you can find our work there. So, you know, even if it is, um, we've been doing podcasts, uh, to borrow a phrase from Reba, we've been doing podcasts since before podcasts were cool. Uh, we've been doing them for a decade now, right? So uh, very short, five minute overview of the work, because if you're um, uh, somebody who wants to listen to a podcast when you're in the car or on the treadmill, you can find out what we've been putting out. Um, and, um, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, however people are accessing and consuming information, uh, we want to make sure that our work is available there. So, uh, you know, and particularly this is important as we delve into some of these um, more science and tech oriented um, subjects, subjects that Tim's going to talk about later. We do want to make sure that, um, that um, we're providing a service from the very broad view, high level, right down to the details. Um, so um, that was, those were the main things I wanted to talk about and I'm happy to um, also uh, answer questions when we get to that uh, portion, but I did wanna share what some of those efforts are because as I said, we, we wanna make sure the, the work is seen, read and valued. And um, so we're trying to come up with uh, innovative ways to make sure that happens. Thank you, Chuck. I think it's great to get a, a sense of what GAO is doing to use, you know, 
21st century communications technologies. I mean, that's the theme of this segment is really, you know, what does the next 100 years look like for GAO? And, you know, as we will get into it with the panelists' presentations, you know, what are we thinking about, like, big picture ways to re-envision how it works and engages with the public and uh, congressional staff? So next, I think we're going to go to Tim Person. So, Tim, uh, great to be back with you again, having a conversation about all the cool stuff you're doing. Each time I check in, there is a uh, you know, another really great project that uh, STAA is is working on. So I'd love to get, uh, you know, a little overview and background for our audience on uh, just the short history of STAA and, you know, what the different uh, components of its work are. Uh, in particular, I think people have a, a kind of an association of it with the sort of former Office of Technology Assessment, but really what you're doing is you know beyond that scope. You're doing technology assessments, but you're also you have an innovation lab. You're doing stuff that's audit adjacent. You're doing kind of future of audit work. Like so, please you know give us a quick overview of the of the core missions, function, and and history of, of what what STAA is working on. Yeah, thanks. Zach. Can you hear me? Okay. Hear you great. Great. Yeah, great to be back uh, in connection with you. Just have a conversation with friends. Uh, uh, thanks for having myself and all of our colleagues on in. Uh, on this, and it's great to be with, of course, Terry and Marcy as well. I look forward to their remarks. It's great to follow the first panel because uh, really between Kate and Tim and then Chuck, just setting things up, we, we have a lot going on. And uh, SWA has strong partnerships uh, within the building to try and accomplish some of these key goals. Uh, one of which the, I just commend uh, Terry and the Napa Study Committee, I thought did a great job identifying uh, one of the key issues for Congress, which is uh, not only that Congress is advised of uh, uh, information. I, I have a friend who is in the former Office of Tech Assessment who says uh, that uh, the Congress is the most advised body in the world. So it's not like it's short of things that is sent to it. Uh, the key thing is what is good about it and of the, of the good information, especially in an era of uh, misinformation and fake news and so on, what is, uh, what is absorbed? And so I think NAP I did a great job of just identifying a look. A lot of this fundamental problem is how do we get it there uh, to this? Uh, one vignette I have is I've seen in our in our all virtual hearings. I know we're going the, the hill is starting to go back to to this, but I've seen uh, a member on a committee who's not the chair of ranking, but just have to sort of uh, zoom in uh, through their smartphone and they're standing in the midst of some event they've had to step out of and do it. I mean, we really are talking about, Zach, as you rightly put out, this 21st century uh, operational tempo with multimedia and everything else. And that was even before the pandemic. So uh, a lot to do. We're excited to be here to do it. So uh, about SDAA, we are uh, over two years old now, and we are uh, proud to be part of the Comptroller's vision uh, or Comptroller General's vision for the for the GAO. One of his key things when you go back to his confirmation hearings in the 2008 timeframe, he's talking about how he's wanted to grow science and tech at GAO. And it's because uh, S&T is essentially uh, in just about uh, everything or every issue, either directly or indirectly. Um, whenever I talk about SDLA, I like to, uh, to, whether it's students or fellow federal community practitioners or what have you, the science and tech policy community, I always say that really you can't pull up the headlines uh, of any given day and not see massive amounts of science and tech issues uh, baked in right there. These are headlines. These aren't buried in the tech section that uh, not a lot of readers read. These are, again, right up front. So I actually did that as part of this. I was going around, and today we have you know, 4,000 people a day in India dying from the B1617 double mutation variant of COVID-19 uh, after a day over day, you know, sort of 400,000 cases. That's all data science driven, but science itself. Then there's the the, the new mod, mod models of uh, vaccination that we're pursuing now with uh, maybe a pill-based or a spray-on base instead of a needle, which would uh, dramatically help where we need to get with the developing world uh, vaccine out in there without the cold chain things. Uh, there's EPA regulations of greenhouse gases. So the issue of uh, climate change is there, uh, the pandemic, uh, cybersecurity issues, uh, and so on. And so all of today, just out of today's headlines, uh, you'll see it there. And so STAA was founded uh, uh, with, uh, in partnership with uh, our uh, clients on Capitol Hill, uh, the Ledge Branch of Probes Committees recognize 
recognizing the need and calling out a new team, uh, as well as uh, with uh, the Comptroller General. And then with a uh, key, uh, I thought, I think a watershed study that Napa led uh, and did independent of us talking about what is the fundamental problem. So we have grown to, uh, I think by the end of this fiscal year, we're expected to be around 120 FTE, uh, which for those uh, OTA uh, um, historians will recall it, it's about the same number that's approaching the same number as the OTE uh, full-time equivalents uh, on that. So uh, we're coming up to size and, and speed in that, although our mission, we definitely, as Kate and Tim mentioned, we are big into the uh, oversight, insight, foresight. So we are doing, as Tim was asked the question about uh, oversight, we answer questions about U.S. innovation and competitiveness the science agencies, which sometimes might not have a big budget per se, like the National Science Foundation are now moving toward the National Science and Tech Foundation. Uh, but nonetheless, that money is extremely important toward the well-being of the future United States as, uh, as we try to innovate and, and compete. Uh, on advanced manufacturing, which we felt the pain of that with respect to getting vaccines scalably and reliably uh, manufactured uh, in time uh, in just as one recent example, but on over to all kinds of uh, uh, science and tech heavy or oriented um, federal programs like advanced weapon systems and others. So we do that. Tech assessment is, of course, uh, that mission that was formally done by the OTA, and we have that a strong foresight bent, the questioner about um, do we do foresight and is there at the appetite? I'm pleased to say yes, uh, the Congress is uh, or does have an appetite for foresight. Uh, and I think I think it's significant that it comes out of GAO's nonpartisan fact-based non-ideological brand. And I think the fact that tech assessments by design are about the technology first and not necessarily about uh, the federal program or nexus, because sometimes we can be very forward-leaning, like was mentioned, quantum computing or quantum technology was one example, as well as others. So we're doing a lot in the, that sort of area. And then as spun out of tech assessments, as Chuck mentioned, and I appreciate him, citing our work because we've been pleased to be partnered with our public affairs office is the Spotlight Series, which is, a, we, again, it's meant to uh, speak into or try and provide solutions into that space whereby uh, things are moving so quickly and how do we get things in a matter of just a few weeks to explain a technology and then lay out some of the uh, implications of things. And we've done many of those just for the COVID crisis, much less we've done uh, essentially two dozen now uh, across a whole spectrum, which includes uh, COVID, and that's in two years. So our production rate has gone way up. We've had a lot of uh, a positive feedback on spotlights. Some of them, uh, they, they weren't generated just to try and produce more work, but as expected, when we laid out what a science or tech issue is and then talked about its implications, some of the the uh, congressional staff and the members said, yes, there's an issue here. We want you to do a full tech, tech assessment on that. So one big one we're doing now that's still very timely and I believe will be as we uh, look at the headlines today and wonder whether or not we'll actually achieve herd immunity here in the United States from COVID uh, is the contact tracing app. So you're gonna have to have testing and contact tracing and all the good public health things, but now with all of our smartphones. And so we have a full study uh, we're doing on that that we're trying to meet and, 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 and move down to the, uh, compress the timelines. And then lastly, what I'll say is, uh, Zach, as you mentioned, we're not the same thing in this in the sense of the uh, former OTA because we do have uh, the benefit now of having a digital society, uh, the datification of the world. GAO has always been about computing and analysis and access to data, but now when you talk about the, the digital nature of it, uh, the scalability of it, uh, and then uh, our leverage uh, leveraging of cloud IT technologies and other things, um, what we're seeing is the, the tool set for the future of oversight, which needs to be much more agile, real time uh, and immersive uh, on that. And so we stood up an innovation lab to help do some, some of those things that you suggested, Zach. Um, uh, the, the Comptroller General's top priorities included uh, pay, uh, the uh, improper payments program, which uh, is billions of dollars uh, over a decade that are spent uh, uh, whether it's through fraud, waste, or abuse, or documentation errors, or whatever, uh, we're trying to bring computation to that to, to try and attack that problem. And so we're working on that now in partnership with executive branch agencies under uh, an, an entity called the Joint Financial Improvement uh, Managers Program. So it's a JFMIP. 
So um, that's one thing that we're doing big. We're also working with our fraud investigators. We have a fraud unit and we wanna build a dashboard for uh, federal program managers to help mitigate fraud. Uh, we developed a fraud framework years ago, but now trying to bring it and almost think of it like a turbo tax for fraud mitigation is what it's for to help uh, do that. So it starts to implement an immersive tool for our program managers to, to do those sort of things. And then one final thing I'll just do, just as a, a little bit of a show and tell, just uh, we've been wanting to help uh, help bring a real-time immersive data to the oversight conversation. And so um, what I'm gonna share with you is our one of our recent publications that was done in partnership with Chuck's group and others on uh, Operation Warp Speed, which of course the vaccine rollout was, was significant. And so uh, with that, what we wanted to do was to be able to share um, our, uh, our results of a report that was, again, in report form, but what we wanted to be able to do is show it in a way that was nonlinear in presentation so you can uh, allow the user to go around and track various vaccines, and by tracking, it just meant where are each of the vaccines with respect to technical maturity, uh, with a system called a te technology readiness level. And these are all the, the vaccines that were funded by, with US dollars by the Warp Speed program. Uh, and then they cover various technologies uh, across, uh, across the spectrum. And so when you click on, uh, let's say AstraZeneca, which is one of the manufacturers, you can, you can track where it is in the, in the technology scale. It could talk about basic things like the dose spacing and so on. It could present real-time updates. This is this is essentially uh, as web scraping or, or data piped in from the National Institutes of Health on where they are in clinical trials. So this is being updated in real time, so that what the the, the member or the staff may see is in real time in terms of um, uh, uh, the particular work. We want to talk about what are the basic technologies, like you've heard about what is messenger RNA or mRNA, and so just like Chuck showed the. The, the mobile telephone and stuff, we want to have this kind of graphic be able to fit to that or a tablet or whatever else, wherever you are, so that our members can immediately see what's the difference between a viral vector platform versus recombination uh, and protein versus the newer mRNA uh, type technology that came out with um, Pfizer and then Moderna. Uh, and then the main issues on manufacturing are a big deal because we're, we're seeing a lot of well, one of the key issues in what's called fill finish. It's not even the advanced uh, technology for mRNA, but we want to talk about the issues on having vaccine capacity for that so that, uh, heaven forbid, we have a sort of an India kind of hockey stick returned to us and we've got to remake a uh, vaccine and so on, or we, as we try and look to the world to try and help out to do that. Uh, this is, as, as Chuck was talking about, classic uh, tracking the money, showing you where things are spent. And then always uh, it's the who's doing what. And so we can provide a little bit of an overview of the program. Uh, again, this is ows.gaoinnovations uh, with an S dot G-O-V. And you can look at that. And then lastly, this is just a, a page on lessons learned from the past, because as, uh, as previous speakers have pointed out, we've been around for 100 years. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, things aren't our first rodeo, so to speak. And so we can talk about here's some lessons learned from the past with a massive institutional amount of knowledge. Uh, I will say that one other, uh, I'll close by saying one other uh, key uh, prototype we're building is we've taken the entire corpus of GA reports from 2013 to present, and we've uh, loaded them into a state-of-the-art cloud environment and used natural language processing to be able to pull out elements of those reports reports across the whole thing. Instead of handing a congressional staffer, here's a stack of all the reports, we're now trying to hand you, here's the content you're looking for based upon your questions. And we're trying to move that uh, time to response from days into maybe even hours as necessary to, again, try and meet that, that speed and that time. So let me stop there. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. We're excited about it, as you can tell, uh, but we appreciate uh, the time here with you today. And I'm happy to answer questions uh, whenever the time is right. Thank you, Tim. It's a great content, great overview of all the stuff you're up to, and you know it's really exciting to see the the progress on on some of these projects, uh, particularly in a time when this kind of work is is so needed. Um, so next, uh, before we get to sort of more general discussion, and there there are a lot of sort of ideas and themes I want to kind of get everyone to weigh in on. But first, we have uh, uh, two more panelists uh, whose perspectives I want to get to first. So Marcy, uh, it's great that you can join us. 
Uh, and I'll turn it over to you. I know you have some slides. And so uh, uh, if I can help share those, let me know. Excellent. Thank you so much, Zach. And oh my goodness, I'm uh, Tim's presentation. I always learn so much whenever he presents and I just heard new things there uh, and got so excited about the dashboard uh, uh, for the, the vaccine process. Amazing. Uh, so I am going to attempt to share. You got it there? Uh, and just say uh, thank you to all of you at, at Lincoln and AEI for, for the invitation. I'm a little bit intimidated to join uh, this panel uh, and, and all the experts uh, talking about the organization that uh, I admire so much. Uh, like Elise and others who spoke today, my uh, first experience with GAO was as a customer. Uh, so for a, a few years, I uh, staffed the waste, fraud, and abuse portfolio for Ways and Means in the health subcommittee. So I was the point person for lots of the mandated reports uh, that came in from the committee's jurisdiction and got to see firsthand the delicate balance uh, between uh, explaining to staffers the methodologies and updating on, on findings and progress along the way before ultimately getting to the report that breaks down the complex issues in a way that that even we... Uh, 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 staffers can understand. So it it was a pleasure to work with GAO then and a pleasure to work now in the context of uh, congressional modernization. So I had the privilege over the last couple of years of working with uh, colleagues uh, on the American Political Science Association uh, Presidential Task Force on Congressional Reform uh, to provide recommendations on technology and innovation uh, for the House Select Committee on Modernization. And that, that's really uh, the, the line that, that ties uh, to this discussion today. Uh, one of the things that we looked at uh, as we were getting ready to, to make those recommendations, uh, we, we had this kind of issue that comes up a lot when you talk about technology in Congress, which is, are you talking about Congress regulating technology and Congress's understanding of technology in the wider world? Or are you talking about how Congress uses technology for its own operations? And of course, as Tim just described, GAO is frequently dealing with all of the above. Uh, and we also looked at all of the above as, as a part of those recommendations. And what we found was uh, this concept of a pacing problem which was originally um, uh, uh, developed by a professor at ASU, was really helpful in thinking about the problems that, that Congress experiences uh, when it comes to technology. And that is, uh, you can see in the chart over to the right, the idea that technology in general uh, develops at a, an exponential rate and policy itself develops at best uh, linearly. So every year there is an increasing pacing problem that, that grows. And of course, uh, what we found as we were developing these recommendations is that Congress doesn't just have one pacing problem, it's got three. Uh, and that is there's the external pacing problem of how Congress understands technology in society and is able to create policies that respond to the changing uh, pace of technology. There's the interbranch pacing problem uh, as Congress continues to give the executive branch authority and funding and other tools for uh, leveraging data and technology for its own operations and sometimes doesn't give itself the same tools. And then there's the internal pacing problem, which is uh, Congress's uh, tendency to not use modern uh, processes and technology for its own operations. So. Uh, as, as we looked at these three problems, uh, we were very happy to, to then find all of the ways that uh, the just mentioned STAA is helping Congress address these pacing problems. So this is directly taken from uh, the budget request uh, this year, describing the work of the STAA uh, and uh, how they are helping uh, Congress keep pace. Um, I was really happy to see these uh, these uh, points in in the appropriations request with an emphasis on supporting evidence based policy making through data analytics, and uh, also uh, developing policy options to help policymakers enhance benefits and mitigate the challenges of technology. I think. 
those are the areas that I hope to see a lot more of in the next 100 years of GAO, which is moving from simply technology assessment to technology for policy assessment. So this is the wish list when Zach invited me to come and, and talk today. I had a few things that we've been talking about for years that I just needed to, to get on the list here. Uh, and many of these as, as uh, presented in the other slide are kind of already underway uh, and many of those within the, the realm of the STAA. But that is more self-initiated work uh, we see that in the spotlights that SCAA is doing. Uh, I think we all understand that if a problem rises to the level of a member of Congress asking for more information about it, then that problem has already reached a place of, of being more acute. So allowing GAO to use its extensive expertise to identify issues that need uh, attention. I was gonna, th I thought that this was a really innovative, crazy idea until Tim's presentation, but that is that dashboards are better than reports as GAO does the work to dig into relevant data and provide analysis. Uh, there is a tremendous work that, it, that they're already doing. So uh, we're obviously seeing the possibility to have more living data ecosystems within the government uh, with work that's being done uh, in the executive branch to standardize some of that data. And I think we will have uh, opportunities for lawmakers to even write requirements for better, more standardized and more available data into laws going forward. The question then becomes who's receiving that data and how can Congress use that data for its own insights, whether it's um, in um, monitoring implementation or in oversight. So I think the idea of GAO as a partner in policy assessment, not just being asked to look at a policy once uh, a bill is passed and implemented to look back and see how things went, but to really be there at the, at the crafting of the legislation, discussing data standards and how reporting should happen, uh, serving as the recipient of data on behalf of the legislative branch to enable ongoing refinement and oversight, oversight, and a policy partner, again, to identify emerging issues and outliers uh, as, as the, the law is implemented. Uh, Elise mentioned this earlier, the idea of GAO as a trusted entity, as she discussed, uh, it's sometimes difficult for others uh, to analyze things like tax data uh, and other sensitive information, but the GAO has a long, uh, well-deserved reputation for being a trusted neutral entity uh, that can be trusted with uh, this information. So as the Data Act and the Evidence-Based Policy Act are implemented and there's more questions about data access and combinations of data and, and, and connectivity uh, at the federal level, GAO can be that legislative branch party at the table to ensure uh, the access for Congress and to the findings that are possible through that data. Uh, I get excited about the idea of GAO reports over the years fed into an AI able to spit out <laughs> real-time uh, information tailored to a, a staffer's request. Tim, you, you've got the, uh, the imagination going. One other thing I wanna flag just in conclusion is uh, thinking about this idea of GAO as a partner at all stages of the legislative process uh, and an opportunity for public facing metrics. So as a part of its uh, strategic goals, the first uh, for GAO is uh, the well-being and financial security of the American people, which is uh, I, of course essential. I think the, the question becomes, how are those two elements measured? And are there ways uh, to even create public facing metrics for those two very important uh, factors that would be um, helpful to the American public to even help, help the public understand how, how they're doing and how they're doing in historical context or even regional context. And so my challenge for the next 100 years of GAO is, is a bit of a, an exploration of could there someday be a kind of policy assessment, almost like a CBO score 
uh, that looks beyond impact on the deficit for impacts on well-being and financial security of the American people at the policy implement at the policy um, uh, design and implementation stages, and even for oversight. Uh, all of that to say, I think that GAO has evolved tremendously over the past uh, 100 years, and I'm excited about what comes next. Uh, I am very excited about the assessment side of uh, GAO and looking forward. Uh, to what comes next. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. All right, uh, next up, I wanna go to Terry Girton, who, who uh, uh, as uh, Tim mentioned, uh, you know, uh, NAPO is involved in uh, a lot of this conversation early on uh, in filling and addressing the capacity gaps in Congress. And also, I know they do a lot of other great work uh, with GAO and uh, adjacent to the oversight community. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to hearing your perspective on all of these issues. Thanks, Zach. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and delighted to be on the panel with such experts. Um, I just wanted to give a, a quick explanation for people who may not be familiar with NAPA, the National Academy of Public Administration. We are not wine. We are not auto parts. <laughs> we are um, congressionally chartered nonpartisan nonprofit, one of only two, the other one being the National Academies of Science. And our charter specifically um, it, it assigns us the mission of working with government agencies at all levels. So predominantly we work with federal agencies, but we also work with state and local government agencies to help uh, government programs work better so that they accomplish the objectives that, um, that the designers had in mind. And we do that principally through our network of about 950 Academy Fellows. These are folks who are elected into membership based on incredible careers in public service um, and incredible accomplishments. And NAPA is kind of unique amongst the good government groups in that we have folks who have deep expertise at every level of government, so federal, state, and local experts, and academics who are really at the front line of research in public administration and public policy. And so we're able to bring all of those perspectives together to help design really comprehensive solutions to some of the most challenging issues that government organizations face. Um, and we have a, a website at napawash.org. You can find uh, all of our recent reports there, including the one we did on um, science and technology advice to Congress. And so I'd encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, as, as that congressionally chartered organization, we have a, a deep and great uh, history and relationship with GAO. Uh, all of the current and former comptroller generals uh, are fellows of the Academy, as are many of the current and former GAO staff. And one of the uh, products that we especially rely on from GAO is the biannual high risk list. Um, and I think that gets to the foresight function in GAO because it sets the stage for a lot of the work that the Academy does in terms of how we engage with especially federal agencies on digging into those risk issues that GAO has identified and helping them think about how to manage them um, in a more effective um, and future focused arena. And that brings me to um, the thing I'd like to talk about today. I'm certainly not capable of the foresight that GAO has. I can't imagine GAO 100 years from now, but I could imagine GAO maybe a decade from now. Um, and one of the great challenges that we see, uh, especially with the complexity of modern government programs is the compliance focused nature of oversight. And Tim mentioned a number of the tools that they're developing to help um, make oversight and compliance easier. But I'd like to posit that we need to think about oversight and accountability in a very different way than we currently do now. Um, one of the things that the Academy has learned, especially over the last couple of years, it's become very, very clear to us, is that there is no significant issue on that high risk list as an example, or in our list of 12 grand challenges in public administration that any single government entity can solve by itself. Um, everything about government these days is intersectoral, it's intergovernmental, it's cross-agency, and our current audit and oversight structures tend not to support that kind of interaction. They're very, um, as they should be, focused on compliance um, and avoidance of fraud, waste, and abuse, 
But what we see, uh, especially now, is that agencies are loath to take initiative because they fear um, that eventual audit, and they and they don't want to be on the wrong side of of an audit. Uh, we just did a report with the National Association of Counties on the CARES Act uh, and the provisions in the CARES Act that supported um, county implementation of initiatives and that hindered county implementation of initiatives. And we found many um, small counties who were it potentially could be in receipt of tens of millions of dollars actually were afraid to take it because it, it was beyond their capacity to implement and they didn't want to do it wrong. And so what I want to suggest is that there's two pieces to how GAO of the future, at least of the next decade, could think about oversight. The first is that foresight, which is absolutely essential, and GAO has an incredible capacity here. But because of their authoritative position, GAO can be the one to say to government agencies at modeling at the federal level, and it will flow down to states and locals and, and, and others, is how to use new technology to improve business processes. For example, not just how do you use AI to do better oversight, but how can you embed AI in your program execution so that you get better program outcomes? And how can you do that in a way that is compliant with good audit and accounting um, practices, but is more flexible for the future? The same with data mining. How can agencies really deploy data mining, again, not to just be in compliance, but to do better program administration? As GAO thinks about those boundaries in the deployment of AI, and data mining, and all kinds of different science and, and IT tools, they can help agencies envision a different future that is very exciting, that is very forward-looking, that is not fearful of compliance, but that knows from the beginning how to, how to deploy these kinds of new tools in a way that will improve outcomes and still be compliant. So that's one place where I think GAO could build on its uh, organic strengths and really help governments imagine a different future that takes uh, best advantage of the tools that are, that are beginning to be deployed, but that people fear um, institutionalizing because they're not sure how to do it in a way that is gonna be compliant with audit standards. The second, I think, it, uh, option here or opportunity is to develop a, a flexibility and agility in audit standards that actually focuses on outcomes um, while assuring accountability in the process. Um, and again, I think uh, I, I would raise the CARES Act as one case of this, but the uh, pandemic response uh, Accountability Committee, I think I've got my acronym correct, the PRAC, has just rolled out a new set of agile audit tools where they're looking at ways that they can provide real-time feedback that are still in compliance with the yellow book and all the other standards that, that good audits go by, but getting engaged, getting the oversight committee engaged at the front end of these really massive and complex programs that we're starting to look at in terms of assisting national recovery and having GAO at the table because they really are the leader of the oversight community, partnered with IGs, partnered with agency attorneys to say, how do we say yes to innovation? How do we say yes to collaboration? How do we say yes to creativity in a way that still assures accountability, but that really gets us all to focus on the outcomes? So when we provide um, you know, the, the, uh, the small business loans. The outcome that you want is people staying employed. How do we think about measuring that in a way that allows us to see the funds flows, that allows us to verify accountability, that allows us to avoid waste, fraud, and abuse, but that really says what we are focused on is the outcomes so that people at the execution level, at the service level, the, at the delivery level in communities, can say, well, if I can take that piece of a federal program and match it with this piece of a federal program and that piece of another federal program, I can be way more effective. I can be much more efficient. I can have far better outcomes than if you force me to stay so piped in the ways that we're used to measuring compliance. So um, I would really uh, highlight those two opportunities where 
I think GAO's foresight around the um, application of technology to, to current government problems is one where they can set a new standard for what's allowable. And the second is creating a vision of a more agile oversight community. Uh, it's a tough problem. Um, these, these are tough issues that we're facing. Um, clearly Congress is worried about it. They gave the PRAC $40 million to help avoid waste, fraud and abuse in the recovery program. Um, we hear stories every day about um, another creative citizen who's found a way to access funds that they weren't uh, actually intended for. But I think if we can allow uh, the folks who have to execute these programs, not just the grant writers at the federal level, but the state and local government agencies and their private sector and non uh, nonprofit sector partners to be more creative in how they blend and braid funds, and, and think about how they achieve the best outcome while never losing sight of compliance and, and accountability um, is something I would love to see in the next decade for GAO of the future. Great, uh, that's, a, that's a great, a bunch of great threads there for, for us to pick up on in the panel uh, discussion. I wanna step back for one minute uh, as we're moving to our kind of open discussion. Um, I know we've thrown around a lot of terms that that you know many of us in this space are are familiar with, but I want to take a moment to talk a little more about like what are the different kinds of analytic products that GAO does. We've talked about performance audits, we've talked about spotlights, we've talked about technology assessments. Uh, I think GAO is most known for its sort of audit work, but uh, you know I think it's important to talk about you know kind of what the difference is and. I thought maybe Tim, you'd be you'd be up for taking this one and, and framing it. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Zach. I'll just I'll, I'll start off at the top of the high level. I like our our previous Comptroller General um, Dave Walker had a hearing years ago when he was when he was doing things and was asked to describe GAO as an entity, and he essentially said, you know, this is a a world class professional services organization that just happens to be in the federal government. So really the, the focus there, I think what Dave was focused, it was, was talking about was the spectrum of work that we do, which predominantly, yes, uh, we, well, we started out our bread and butter, you know, a century ago was financial audits, right? It was strictly that. But then in the seventies, we really developed the performance audits and that distinction was outlined by uh, Tim Bowling. The other, I, I'm the other Tim, he's the, he's the chief quality officer. So he's, he's big Tim at GAO. But uh, what, what Tim had, had outlined was the, this differential between not just making sure the accounting of the funds is done uh, in accordance with the yellow book. Now it's the, what do I get out of that? Uh, and then uh, you, we have, uh, as Etta was, was there, she was our, uh, our, our key leader and general counsel today uh, doing the presentation. And Etta leads a group that, that does a bid protests, which is that uh, Kate mentioned you're giving some uh, voice to those who might have not won the bid for a federal contract and GAOs uh, has a way to, to deal with or adjudicate bid protests and then produce uh, outcomes on that. Our appropriations attorneys are very steeped in appropriations law. In fact, I'm told that, and I, I believe it totally, uh, that uh, a lot of times for appropriations actions, the Hill will just say, how do I do this? And they'll, they'll be able to have that on-demand technical assistance. But that leads into what we're doing also, in, and we, we're growing the capacity. Uh, all GAO mission teams have this, and, and SDAA is no different. We just want to do it even more, is have that on-demand technical assistance. So it's just the, if you need something, just give us a call, right? We, we do have of our menu of options of responses is that we don't know, right? So we'll start with that. If we don't know something, we'll say, we don't know. Uh, on the other hand, uh, given a century of work and given the digital nature of things and given what we're doing in the lab, it's now becoming, uh, I think we're increasing our ability to be able to compile even especially longitudinally uh, 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 answers that could look at and say, look, over the last, this is how we've seen uh, such and so program evolve and things like that. Um, you know, the high risk list is every two years you can track and if you track the change of certain things, is that trending better? Is it about the same or are they, are, are things being implemented? And, and so I think, I think that that's, uh, that's the kind of service that, that we're providing increasingly. So, so really, and then, and then as Marcy pointed out, and thanks Marcy for, 
featuring the language of because that that is the the sort of the the full menu description of what we're trying to do in STAA and uh, we really do have a passion for evidence based policy making. How do we make the the reason for the dashboard was the idea of giving the member those two members were. Uh, very delighted that that we this is the the chair and then the ranking member of the um, uh, house uh, subcommittee select subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis and so in a bipartisan way they were very happy to be able to be briefed on the dashboard yes we have a written report you can you can read all that this is built out of that but in a nonlinear immersive way we'll present the data it'll be updated and you can go in your time and your way at your uh, mode of communication and things and have your staff and or have your staff do it. And so presenting the framework for things and uh, just as Terry was talking about the, um, how do we uh, support even the state and locals and our Comptroller General is very passionate about uh, not only the federal, but the state and local, especially because a lot of times it's where a lot of the money, is, federal money is spent. There's in block grants and so on. So it, it is a team sport as Terry said, and how we do that and create like in our fraud case, we're creating that kind of turbo taxi thing to support the federal program manager, but it could also be the state or local. It's just, these are the things that you're gonna have to deal with to counter fraud. And uh, as was mentioned, PRAC is also thinking in the same way. So again, I think we're adding things to the menus act that really are trying to be a full spectrum, especially though in, in dialing up the operational tempo to be there as soon as possible so that we're not really uh, a day late and a dollar short in terms of supporting. We can do the best work possible, as you know, but if we're a day late, dollar short, it's effectively not meeting that window of need and we, we have to change that, so. So if you're explaining that really succinctly to say a new a new Hill staffer is coming in, uh, you know, wants an analysis of, you know, something like Operation Warp Speed or what our grant making is at NIH, you know, in what circumstances would they want uh, a TA versus one of the other kinds of yeah, reports right. that GAO does? Right. And so what's the difference? Yeah. So if I can just bottom line it up front here on this, we want the staff to only be burdened to ask the question. OK, so and then to work from that and say, what is it that you need? And uh, I should have mentioned TA and the whole thing, you know, leading that that particular thing. That's a that's a big issue. That's our big foresight work on. You know what, there's a big trend, there's something called quantum computing coming, or there's 5G coming, and it's already kind of starting to be here, but there's still a now and the not yet story on various things. It's internet of things, it's AI machine learning, as, ter as Terry was talking about. All of these particular issues say, here is what is, is unfurling. There are various scenario-based ways to think about it and hear how it's going to impact you, uh, almost like, I, I, it's not a prediction game, but it's uh, you should, uh, the way I like to think about it is the way that we, when we do a uh, hurricane tracking, we always have the envelope increase in its size as it goes forward. But sooner in, you you have a, 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 a the the cone of uncertainty is is a little bit narrower, so you can speak into various levels of the cone and say, look, there's a lot of uncertainty way up here as you draw the time horizon out. Or there's some nearer term things that you might need to think about, and that's supporting that proactive agile kind of uh, oversight so that you're thinking thoughts even before the client may think about them and say, you know what, you haven't asked, but here are the various things. And that's the element that you're seeing in our policy options on a given tech assessment, let's say. You're seeing it in the implications of the spotlights that we're doing. You're seeing it in the services that we're doing uh, across the board, and especially in including uh, the evidence-based data analytics uh, oriented uh, capabilities that we're wanting to bring to bear to uh, the Congress. I want to take a step back and, and open this, this theme up, this idea of foresight to the other panelists. Uh, I know, Marcy, this is something you've talked about in, in discussing the sort of technology pacing problem and, and also more holistically about the challenge for uh, Congress to do kind of horizon scanning. Uh, I know Napa in, in its report also recommended the, the creation of what they called an OXTA, which has been an office to uh, engage in, in, in horizon scanning work on science and technology issues and help Congress sort of translate and absorb that and interface with the science and tech community. Uh, and also, I think we haven't mentioned, but uh, I think JO has another office uh, which does strategic foresight work, which I believe is still uh, uh, around 
and you know has I think some fellows and some other kinds of activities that it's doing as well. And so I wanted to open that up and see if uh, Marcy or Terry or Chuck, if you had any uh, additional thoughts to weigh in on how to address this sort of foresight challenge for, for Congress. Well, I mean, just to say that I think that that is the dream. Uh, I, I love the, the hurricane projection analogy because I, I think that that um, is is helpful for members, even in understanding what's possible. And I, I forget who's quoted is that that all all models are wrong, but but most some are helpful. Uh, and you know, I. I we essentially historically have governed by uh, anecdote. You know, somebody comes from their district and says, well, my farmers say this is going to impact us this way. And somebody comes from their district and says, well, my city dwellers say it's going to impact them this way. And, and you know, that that is our system. And having the ability, especially, uh, Tim, I think the, the point about the dashboard is so key right now when it, when uh, single sources of truth are so fraught and difficult to come by to have members looking at the same information uh, at, at the onset of a policymaking process, but then being able to see how the line moves through implementation to say, well, we thought it was going to do this, but it looks like it's doing this. And, and to be able to look together at the same information, I think that there's, there's really an opportunity there to get past, I mean, I, I understand I sound a little bit Pollyanna about the potential for data to save us all and overcome the political acrimony, but it, it really is an important piece, I think, to some of these conversations. And so, you know, right now, GAO is almost having to operate um, backwards when it's time to pull together a dashboard like that. You have to go and pull from available data and kind of cobble together what you think would be most helpful. I think it becomes really exciting when you're able to meet with those policymakers on the front end and talk about what kind of data would be helpful, what format, what standardization, how it could be um, uh, designed to also provide information that's useful at the state and local level, as you mentioned. So I think uh, getting in early on the conversation and for the, the members to see GAO as a partner in this and to see the benefit that comes to them down the road when, when GAO is there at the, at the offset is, is really exciting. And Marcy, to your point, that was uh, a lot of the vision that we had for the Office of the Congressional Science and Technology Advisor that we recommended in the Academy's report, which was now back in October of 19. It seems ancient. Uh, but we did recognize the point that you made in your slides about the rapidly changing technology environment and that any organization, if it was inside Congress, was going to have difficulty keeping up with that pace. And so the vision for this bicameral office is small. Uh, but supporting both sides of Congress was both as a clearinghouse for congressional requirements, so perhaps a collector of the anecdotes, right, to find out that there's critical mass in a particular storyline, and could we get uh, Congressional Research Service and GAO and other experts from the technology space together to identify um, what's emerging in that, you know, what, what might be truth, what might be um, a story, and be able to pull that together to work with the, the experts to develop um, a quick response. The other key piece of it was that whoever was that advisor needed to have a very robust science network and be able to reach to the experts wherever it was um, to, to not be hamstrung by uh, a small you know, professional research staff of their own, but rather to be able to reach out at a moment's notice to find the most current uh, information and, and advice on a particular issue, and then be able to share it back to the relevant congressional committees. The third piece we had in mind for that um, advisor was as an assistant to build science and technology expertise back into relevant congressional committees. And that rather than fund a standalone organization, the best way to increase the absorptive capacity, as Tim mentioned, of congressional organizations was to rebuild science and technology expertise in the relevant committee staff and to add those folks back in. So that Office of the Science and Tech Advisor could help recruit um, and ensure the, the timely rotation of expertise into the congressional committees. Um, and so uh, that, that part of our report has not been implemented yet, at least not to my knowledge. Um, 
Congress has taken a couple of actions on the other pieces, and we're pleased to see that. But we really think that this integrated body in the Congress, not one that does its own research per se, but that has rapid reach out to the experts in the field and can bring that information back into Congress is a key piece of uh, moving Congress forward in their pace of dealing with the technology challenges that are on the horizon. And Zach, now you, me, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say you you raised, uh, we, have, we do have a Center for Strategic Foresight uh, that we established um, uh, about two years ago. And in fact, what that group is doing right now is they have been canvassing all of our internal subject matter experts in the different topic areas and, and beginning to compile trend papers in each of the different subject areas that we um, look at, uh, which will be issued publicly uh, as well. So um, that sort of work is critically important to build on what Tim was saying about the dashboard, because I'll tell you, it also requires GAO to think about how to produce this work differently, because typically, you know, GAO thinks, okay, we're going to do an audit. Is it going to be a letter report or is it going to be a correspondence or which of the audit production buckets does it fit into? But instead, we have to begin to think of ourselves more, and, and I think the dashboard's a good example, as a knowledge-based organization. The most important thing is for us to share the knowledge. Uh, which GAO format it fits into is secondary, but most important, how do we share the knowledge and how do we do it in a digital environment to make it easier for others to share? So that's one of the great things about Dashboard as, as a first um, very important step towards inside GAO thinking about how we provide information differently. No, I mean, given that some of these things have, have uh, you know, developed since the uh, you know, NAPA report was released, I'm curious if you have any thoughts, Terry, as to whether, you know, pieces of this OXA function are something that, you know, some of these capacities in GAO can take on or whether that's best served as a, as a sort of fully autonomous uh, entity as originally envisioned. Sorry. I was reminded as uh, Chuck and Tim were talking about the spotlight reports that those were still just emergent when we were doing this report. Um, and I'm really delighted to see um, the traction that they've gotten, the progress that they've made, the breadth of topics that they're able to cover. Um, you know, one of our other recommendations was for CRS uh, to be able to uh, do their real time, you know, expand their real time uh, advice to Congress. And I think that's happening as well. Um, however, I don't think this clearinghouse function has really taken root yet in the Congress, and I do think it's very, very important. The government has limited assets like SPAA or Congress, uh, the CRS, and so to the degree that they are all bombarded by the same questions, there is the need for sort of a, a mediator to figure out how best to answer that. Let's take it off GAO's plate. Let's give it to CRS. Let's I can make a phone call and get that information. Um, and so there's an opportunity to really um, expand the capacity of uh, the, the, the advice that's given to Congress if we have this organization in place. Uh, the organizations that we have are making great progress um, and Congress has increased funding for both of them, um, but it's not sufficient to do that kind of clearinghouse uh, and, and outreach um, mission that we had in mind for the OXTA. Now, let me ask you, uh, you know, piggybacking off of, of that sort of idea of these different entities within Congress. Now, Marcy, I know we've talked about, uh, you know, this idea of like optimizing the kind of user experience for congressional staff around interfacing with support agencies, getting questions answered, finding what resources exist. Is that something you can talk about a little bit? And, you know, how, how does this work? I mean, you're a former staffer. Uh, you know, they have a, an intranet, but it's different on the House, it's different on the Senate. You might not always know that, you know, what all the different teams do within GAO or that there are congressionally chartered entities and how you work with them. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, particularly in the context of, of all the work you've been doing on, you know, information technology in Congress and the work of the, uh, the select committee on modernizing Congress and, and the House and, and uh, so forth. Thank you. Yes, and we could 
talk for a very long time about the difficulties of, of getting the right information to the right staffers and even just the turnover of staffers. So as soon as you know what you're looking for, you might be moving on to another position and, and GAO has to introduce themselves to a, a, a totally new uh, crop of, of congressional staffers. So it, it is a challenge and uh, it's a challenge at, at all points of the institution. Institutional knowledge is a tough thing to retain and make available. Uh, for congressional staff throughout uh, the institution. I, I think uh, for GAO, CRS, JCT, and others that are providing um, information for staffers, the ones who are really steeped in it know where to go look, uh, but I think it's it's sometimes hard for them to know when new information is available. So for example, the, the spotlights and other uh, topical information uh, if if that's not your area of focus, you may not know that uh, a new uh, uh, report or spotlight or other uh, letter has has been put out there. And, and yes, I know GAO has has a website, and uh, you know, same with the House and HouseNet. There there's a lot of information that exists. Finding it is what is a challenge. Uh, we've actually been working with uh, some nonprofits and others to pull together a resources hub that would combine external uh, resources with internal resources and just pr provide a more um, uh, agile, advanced search that would search across uh, different entities, as well as uh, uh, something that I've, I've talked with SCAA about a bit, the ability for staffers to follow a topic so that they would receive updates on uh, uh, issues that they cover, whether it's a GAO report or CRS report or a letter from an organi a nonprofit organization or anything else that's bubbling up just because it's so difficult to kind of wrangle the massive quantities of information coming into Congress. Uh, but uh, lots lots of experiments happening, but I, I think it is it is one of those wicked problems to solve just because there's there's so much information coming in to each individual staff. And Chuck, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that or or the different approaches that the different congressional support agencies have, have taken in how they disseminate information and interface with staffers. I know, you know, CRS has a lot of more kind of rapid response kinds of activities and 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 ways of engaging. Uh, CBO, I think, publishes its reports and I think all their new ones are in HTML with graphics, which is really you know, nice if you're on different kinds of devices and it looks like, you know, from your presentation, you're you're thinking about a lot of new ways to sort of present information and and engage. And I'm curious if you have anything to to add to this. Yes, uh, you yeah, know, we do um, uh, have been looking at. Uh, we have a project called New Blue. If you remember the old GAO Blue covered Blue reports, uh, <laughs> New Blue is uh, we're trying to. Uh, publish everything in HTML uh, and ensure that uh, you know that we're not locking everything down in a in a PDF. Um, if you looked at some of the CARES Act work we've done this year, we've published all of it in HTML, um, and we published uh, um, several of our special products this year in HTML. But we're moving towards every report, every testimony in HTML, and scannable, easier to read on a mobile device. Particularly, so the user can jump through different to different sections. You know, they may be particularly interested in one section, and they're not going to sit down and read a 200-page PDF. But they're going to, you know, be able to jump to the different sections that are particularly relevant to them. So um, I, the goal is, you know, towards the end of this year, um, to be publishing most of our work in HTML or early next year. So uh, we're definitely moving along uh, on that front. We're also talking to uh, CBO and uh, CRS and our colleagues in the legislative branch about the um, the efforts that they take uh, and trying to figure out how best to serve the needs of the clients. Uh, as Marcy mentioned, I worked on the Hill for six years too. And that was, you know, before the, 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 the information incoming um, fire hose that we have today. And it was hard then to keep track of everything. So um, increasing targeted outreach uh, is one of the things we work closely with our congressional relations uh, clients on. We do have the a way that exists, you know, currently for, for um, anybody to subscribe, to follow topics. 
so that they know every time we put out a report, they can subscribe by topic and get an email. Um, but that's not uh, foolproof either. And so, you know, I think the targeted outreach and knowing um, which members and staff are interested in which reports and being and making sure we follow up on, with them every time there is a new report and that we're specific about why this is different than the last report and making it very clear to them, again, respecting the, the uh, staffer's time about why they may want to look at this report and what's new vis-a-vis -vis what we put out previously. I'll just jump in real quick. Just second what Chuck's saying. I, I really think Chuck nailed it when he talks about GAO the next hundred years. And I think it piggybacks well on what uh, Marcy and Terry were saying is that it really is we're knowledge providers. So I'd love to see the future day. We're not there yet, but I'd love to see the future day where you sort of pick up your uh, voice enabled device and say Alexa or Google or whatever, what does GAO have on X? And then it comes out, it's a content centered uh, type thing instead of saying, you know, here's a list of 20 reports that we might have done over the last several, and the reports are excellent. It's, it's the issue is how do we unlock the content to meet that time frame and so on. So we can't. We need to not change GAO. Our quality standards aren't going to change and ought not to. Uh, but how do we make them, uh, you know, fall into uh, the world that we're into today? And the technology like HTML is just an enabler uh, to uh, accomplish that. So, you know, getting getting into the sort of mechanics of that real quick before I get to, I think we have a couple questions on YouTube. I'm gonna make it too, but I'm gonna use my moderator's prerogative and, and get at this one. Um, you know, speaking to the sort of foresight versus hindsight challenge, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, uh, Congress is talking about or interested in is often, you know, lagging behind what say Silicon Valley is talking about. So, you know, you might have been hearing about how great blockchain is 10 years ago uh, uh, and all the issues that are coming up with it. Now it's on to, you know, various other uh, uh, things or 5G or, or what have you. And so, you know, one of the things that I think CRS does well is, you know, they'll often write reports sort of trying to anticipate what the, you know, congressional need or interest or hot topic is going to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, I know you guys have your own authority, um, the Comptroller General's authority to sort of do a report, but it's a bigger investment typically to do like a TA or a really big audit, um, which is probably what a key differentiating factor is than writing a, a, you know, a 15 or 20 page CRS report on a topic. But to what extent have you thought about, you know, in the interest of, of promoting uh, uh, foresight, whether you need to take some of these big topics like AI or next generation telecom and, and you know, have a report that you kind of update every couple of years in the way that, that CRS tackles, you know, many of these kinds of topics. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. Like we could sort of da have a dashboarded TA that does track over time. And then you change, just like the hurricane track, and you change the envelope as, as it develops and so on, or as the, the dynamics of the policy. I, I think that's entirely possible. I don't think that's, that's a technology issue. We just have to think about how we, we make sure we express that. And uh, the good news is we are doing that. We have an entire series that you'd be amazed at how much AI work we've already uh, done. Uh, one of the most important AI jobs we're doing actually right now, Zach, is uh, a whole, it was a Comptroller General Forum that we already had, but that we're writing out a framework for the oversight of AI. So it fits exactly in with what Terry is. How do we pr provide that framework? And then sort of, just like with the fraud, kind of dashboard we're thinking about for those program managers, we need to have an AI accountability one that really gets down into that. It's, it's, it's really enterprise risk management. So we move away from just that you can't, there's no checklist to check on oversight and AI just by itself, right? It's going to have to be risk managed. There is going to be a future of, it's not if AI, it's how AI. And then, and really the A isn't so much artificial, it is the augmentation of the human function. So we need to understand the breakdown of what it is we're trying to accomplish, how the augmentation is going to be helping us to consume all those things that we don't have time to do. Uh, and in the midst of, by the way, when we're already using retail AI again on our handsets, so it's not like we aren't already kind of getting used to this, but how do we, again, become that, deliver that knowledge uh, delivery uh, type mission that Chuck was talking about using the tool 
uh, but also providing that oversight for AIs because we don't know every possible risk or something from some given federal program manager or whatever. We need to uh, let them look at the framework and then express it in their own unique way. You could be local, you could be state, you could be federal. So seg segueing that into a YouTube question, uh, that I've got, uh, which is about, you know, how JAO approaches recruiting kind of top technical talent, scientists. I know people in like the AI field are uh, very much in demand, likely very expensive. Um, I know JAO, uh, you know, is a little unique in, in having a, a an office in Silicon Valley, uh, which is a, a great a great thing to have. But, um, you know, responding to that question, what does GAO, GAO do to, to try to bring in top talent? And, you know, what might it be doing, you know, in the future to augment that capacity? Sure. So there's several ways that we do that. It's context dependent. For example, if we need to talk to people, uh, into, uh, you know, a supremely uh, gifted group of individuals across different sectors, across, across different uh, disciplinary areas, we do have a standing relationship that actually our, our current Comptroller General set up years ago and had the foresight to do this when he was the Chief Operating Officer uh, to have a standing contract with our National Academy. So on every topic we do, it could be 5G, it could be water technologies for use in agriculture, it could be uh, you know emerging infectious diseases and so on. Uh, National Academies will help us with that convening of science and technology folks for a GAO meeting as part of the study. That's one layer. Another I clarify, layer, that's, uh, that's the, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, not yes, NAFA, yes. or is it, do you ever collaborate with NAFA as well? Uh, uh, right, we, <laughs> we, we uh, I, look, I'm open to all, I know NAFA <laughs> has a deep, uh, and like, like Tara said, we have a strong relationship with NAFA uh, I don't see that changing. I, in fact, I see it strengthening, and I, I, I have no reason to believe we couldn't uh, we couldn't uh, do various outreach things with them as well. This is just a lot of the, the things that we have are the questions about where do you get your scientists right out, outside of the, the good ones you already have in SPLA, and and the answer is it's a customized or bespoke approach for each study. Uh, we also are building our uh, university and outside expertise networks uh, as a part of a routine uh, layer of work. We are connected with federal uh, and national lab or FFRDC, which is a federally uh, funded research development centers. All over the country, we have exceptionally gifted folks in those areas that we know through our work, the, uh, the ongoing, uh, whether it's foresight or oversight, it doesn't matter. So we've been building that kind of Rolodex to be able to do that. And then of course, for the permanent staff, we do like to do outreach in, in, and uh, go to and, and have growing relationships with uh, scientific professional societies like uh, IEEE, which is the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers, or the American Chemical Society, or ACS. Those two are some of the biggest ones, as well as those who are passionate on science and technology, like the AAAS, uh, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So um, that's all just in the sciency area. We're connected with them, and uh, we have a, a great relationship and want to continue to, to, to build on those to do that and to recruit their staff into permanent mm -hmm. positions, which, which we are doing. So there's a lot, a lot right. of things going on that's unseen, but that's the, the, the answer to that question. Yeah, you know, it seems like your your staff in, in your office in SCAA has grown a ton in the last right. few years uh, right. you know, since the NAPA report. And yeah, and I think right. you're over, over 100 uh, FD staff now, I believe. Right. It's, it's projected um, by the end of this fiscal year. So September 30, we'll have about 120 permanent FTE. And those are experts across a wide array of advanced degrees. So we have uh, on the technical degrees, we have people with PhDs in the engineering science. So pick uh, your top engineering, electrical, uh, we have aerospace, right? We have, we have systems and so on and things like that, as well as now because of the Innovation Lab, we have the data scientists, we have data engineers, we have cloud IT architects, uh, those sort of folks, which are, are we think are going to be uh, incredibly valuable to what's going on, not only for GAO and its efforts, First, we're to the Congress, uh, like to the Modernization Committee or to the Committee of House Admin, who's, who reached out to us, for example, just to ask for help on, you know, like e-voting. We, we had a chamber that for uh, centuries had never had a all virtual way of operating. And so 
uh, th those, these are some of the unthe unseen things that we've we've done. But that's that's sort of a sketch of of the kind of folks that we have on board. All the physical sciences, we have uh, social science connections, we have economists, we have S and T policy experts, uh, you name it, and we have. Well, thanks, Tim. And uh, we could talk about this all day, but uh, I've got the last sort of five minutes here. I want to pose, a, you know, take a step back, take a 30,000 foot view to this question. Really, you know, we're about this. This panel is about, you know, GAO in the 21st century, uh, you know, around GAO centennial. You know, what does GAO look like in the next 50 or 100 years is the question I want to pose to the panel. You know, what, you know, what is the far future for, for GAO look like? What kinds of tools might it use and, and how would you imagine it, Tim? I think you already answered that we, right. we might alas, ask Siri or Alexa. So I'm going to pose this to, to see if the other panelists want to start. And, you know, maybe Marcy, what is what is the future uh, GAO look like in, in you know, 2080 or, or what have you? Well, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it in the presentation, but I think I think the future of GAO is is connected to the future of how we make and implement and oversee laws in in 2080 or, or whenever it happens to be. And I think that that will be much more outcomes driven. So the, the, the political process will be around what do we want to accomplish and that there will be uh, lots of uh, data modeling and uh, um, analysis on policy options. I think we may see bespoke policies implemented in different places and a place like GAO having the capability to analyze the success of those various implementation strategies to uh, uh, accomplishing the, the goals set in policy almost in real time so that adjustments can be made along the way, so that there's transparency, so that there's refinement in an ongoing way. I think we'll be making very different policy and I think GAO will be uh, a key part of, of that process. Anyone else, Terry or Chuck, any thoughts? I'd just build on what Marcy said in terms of real time um, analytics and assessment. I think getting to the point where it doesn't take two years to go back and collect all the data to be able to tell someone in another year how they did three years ago um, is going to be really important so that uh, collectively as a nation, we start to accumulate and track data on performance and outcomes in real time. We can track accountability in real time so that we can use the risk management approach to figure out where things are working fine. We don't need to spend a lot of attention where we have indicators of trouble, we can go after that uh, and be much more responsive, uh, have faster corrections uh, and implement uh, these new technologies and tools as they come to us rather than you know, having to think a long time about how to do it to the point where they're obsolete before we ever get them implemented. Not that that's GAO's problem, that's sort of a national problem, but as GAO can, can lead the way um, from its authoritative position and helping all of us think about how to do this in a more responsive, uh, you know, real-time approach, I think we'll all be better off. And I would agree with that. And, and there's a nice marriage here between what Terry and Marcy were both saying, because, you know, leadership is going to be very important because all of the audit organizations, to some degree, um, are risk averse and don't want to be the first ones to jump out and try something new. But in, in the leadership role that GAO has, I think uh, we could do that. You know, we can try new approaches. Um, we can, we are doing some real time auditing now and we can build on that. Um, and, and not only build on the audit work itself, but then how to share the audit work and share the data that we're coming across and do so in a way that provides leadership to other levels of government and other agencies about, about how to do that and is results uh, focused. So, you know, I, I would hope, you know, over the coming uh, decades that that's a position GAO can put itself in and, and begin to demonstrate um, uh, success as, an, as a knowledge sharing organization and a leader um, in the uh, accountability community. That's a great note to, to end on. And, uh, I want to thank you all for your expertise and, and insight on this conversation today. And to our uh, listeners on, in the audience on, on YouTube, uh, I'd like to thank you for 
for joining and sticking with us for several hours now of uh, a really good wonky conversation. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Kevin, my co-organizer, who I think is still with us on the Zoom. If you're still there, say hi, Kevin. Um, it was great putting this together with you. I look forward to uh, future collaborations on on these kinds of topics at the intersection of technology and governance. And so I uh, look forward to seeing you all next time. And uh, it was great uh, having this conversation.